on um, HIV prevention and social justice. We will have as panelists the Honorable Professor Sid Hamed Mogea from the Pan African Parliament, Madam Jose uh, Mr. Olushegun Odomosu, uh, Madam Annabelle Rowe, and uh, Nelly Mwaka, and then Dr. Innocent Modisar Tile, and our facilitator. Facilitator will be Madam Ruth Labot. But before that, uh, the summary of uh, our deliberations of yesterday will be done by our colleague, the Honorable Juliana, that is uh, the chairperson of uh, the Committee on Health from Malawi that will come and give us the summary of yesterday's deliberations before we go into our third panel session. So I would invite uh, Honorable Juliana to take the floor, and I will ask uh, all the panelists to also join the high table. Uh, so, um, Ju Madam Ruth also should uh, come as uh, the facilitator. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and all the honorable members here and the dignitaries. I'll read through our key principles and uh, some of the key issues that came out yesterday during our deliberations. Uh, where, as Africa high level parliamentary uh, caucus, we are looking at achieving health targets and not leaving everybody behind. On the key principles, there are issues that came out that members of parliament are the representatives of the people, and as such, they have the power to add uh, to, uh, to power and added advantage of proximity to the highest power in the land, as well as lower communities. We also looked at uh, the issue that investment in health is investment in economy. We looked at optimizing uh, the, the oversight role of, of MPs, that the MPs can make a difference on accountability by demanding efficiency in resource utilization for, the health, uh, for health. Another key principle that came out is that governments, including the institution of parliament, is the constitutional convener of health delivery, delivery, uh, service delivery institutions. And draconian law are created by parliamentarians, and they can be reviewed, re repealed by the parliamentarians themselves. And as we continue talking, we looked at the, uh, what needs to be done for, for us Africans to achieve parliamentary, to, to achieve health targets in Africa. We said that Africa has achieved significant gains in. Uh, uh, significant gains in the area of HIV, AIDS, TB. We had presentations looking at, and that we have achieved, uh, we have achieved so much in the treatment, prevention, and some countries have repealed draconian laws. However, we said that modest and complacency should not be allowed to creep into the response programs. MPs guarantee access to health through prudent engagement of all sections of the community and leave no one behind, especially key populations. We all know key populations is quite a big issue out there, and we need to keep on talking about it. And it is incumbent about PAP and all parliamentarians to denounce all forms of discrimination. 
We also looked at the issue that the greatest source of optimism in Africa is the inherent potential in youth in context of demographic dividends. Prevention, prevention, and prevention should be the, uh, the mantra for all members of parliament in the area of HIV AIDS, in the area of health. Failure to fund AIDS is failure to save lives. We, we got examples from Zimbabwe, how they have really created the fund that we, are, we all thought we can emulate, emulate and keep on talking to Zimbabwe to learn. Africa has an opportunity to create Africa Growth Health Fund to fund the response to, scourge of, uh, to the scourge of epidemics. We look at how we are still donor dependent and what is it that we can do to make things different. MPs need capacity building on technical, technical aspects for them to effectively conduct advocacy on health related policy issues. We looked at what our colleagues from the civil society can do to partner with MPs to do something different and continue the advocacy out there. And that there's a strong need to engage the church or faith-based organizations to anticipate awareness on HIV AIDS. Then we, uh, in our discussion, some strategies came out part of the take home messages for all of us as members of parliament and technicians that we need to intensify sensitization and awareness campaign at all levels and as parliamentarians we have the, the added advantage on that. Institute calibrated health service delivery and specialized interventions for rural areas. Reach out to schools through integrational health and education programs to advocate for prevention among young people. We all know HIV AIDS has, has a, a, a youth face. We need to focus the interventions at a family level through door-to-door -door model. Intensify empowerment and entrenchment of the child and women's rights. We are still struggling in our countries and we need to work hard and be vigilant in this area. Conduct intergeneration dialogue to bridge information gap between generations. And finally, scale up, test and treat by among others, combining the voluntary testing with other leisure events. Examples we are given like the Coca Games and other popular cultural activities. On health financing and sustainability, which was the session in the afternoon, we agreed that shared responsibility and global responsibility is still an important principle. We can't leave everything to the global community to help us in the area of health sector. Africa should view health not only from a social point of view, but also as development, investment, and economic point of views in order to harness the associated dividends of the, of the health sector. We looked at how, as Africa, we are still depending on other countries like India to, you know, for procurement of uh, resource uh, of our medicines and supplies, and even for medical treatment. Dependence on external resources sets countries as a precarious path, as it is not sustainable, given that the traditional donors' pri priorities have shifted. We have all seen it in our countries. Investment in other sectors is good, but governments should recognize that investment in health has a multiplier effect as it supports sustainability of other sectors. We all agree health nations who um, will contribute to the development of the country. One dollar invested in health may yield return on investment up to $15, and that advocating for free health care may antagonize the campaign for domestic funding. If we all say everybody should give free health care, who is there to find our health care? So we looked at the strategies that we, uh, that we could think about, and three issues came out, that government should increase domestic financing through, among other things, diversified and innovative financing, diversify health financing through plausible levers and surcharges, e.g. the case of Zimbabwe and its levy, and Africa should strongly consider South-South cooperation as well as triangular cooperation, and somebody also put in a very good point here where we are saying the whole issue of illicit financial flows, how do we follow up these issues and make sure that the resources stay in our countries. On access to medicines and commodity security, we are saying Africa requires strong regulatory framework for medicines production industry, and we get we had the case of NEPAD and the initiatives that are doing it uh, right now. Special attention should be placed on quality, safety, and efficacy of medicines in order to prevent proliferation of counterfe counterfeit medicines. And appropriate skill sets for moving pharmaceutical industry are missing, particularly in the areas of research innovation and technology. We all agreed we need to do those things in our, uh, right here in Africa. And on the strategy, we agreed on six points as a group that leadership should focus on promotion of local production of medicines, the case of getting everything from India and other Far East countries, 
African government should strive to create enabling environment for viable pharmaceutical production. Africa should move to production of medicines instead of consumption only. And pharmaceutical industry has a potential to trigger and stimulate a wide range of other technology inputs, thus creating employment. We know unemployment is a huge issue among our youth and even those older in our countries. And we have to remove trade barriers that hamper inter-Africa trade. And somebody talks about all oh, the issues of, about trips. We need to explore trips, flexibles, and, and harness associated benefits in order to increase access to medicine in Africa. So in a nutshell, these are the issues that we agreed as a summary in the country. I hope the moderators will see if we missed anything and people want to add anything more. Thank you very much. Am I assuming now I'm taking over the chairmanship? I can do so. Thank you. <laughs> um, all protocols observed. I want to say good morning and welcome to this session where issues of social justice and preventions will be discussed and uh, my panelists will give us the strategies on closing the tap on new infection and ensuring access to uh, medicines and also they will also look at legal frameworks for ensuring that KPs are able uh, KP's rights are upheld and also they can access uh, health services. But before I even invite my, my panelists, I want to thank the person who's just given us a feedback from yesterday's session, uh, Honorable Juliana, the chairperson of the uh, Committee on Health in Malawi. That girl is a tough cookie. She has just declared in her country, in her party, that she's going to compete for the presidential seat. If nothing else, that is enough for us to say. That declaration alone is powerful. <laughs> uh, so my panel, I've got a very powerful panel here. I have uh, Professor Sidi Ahmed Moguya from PAP. Yes, you lift your hand so they see you. Yeah. I've got uh, Ms. Jose Koch, Evidence of HIV Prevention in Southern Africa from EHPSA. I've got Mr. Olushegu, your doctor, Dr. Olushegu Odomusi from AMSHA, Mrs. Annabel Ro, Southern African Litigation Center. Then I've got uh, Nelly from UNDP missing. I'm very concerned about this because I noted yesterday also Sadak was missing. Please take note, Savelo, about this. This is not right. And then we've got the Dr. Innocent Modi Tsoli. Why can't I pronounce this? Modi Tsile, Senior Advisor to the UNFPA. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you each five minutes. Uh, you, you just put your summary in. Some of the things you can't say will come as the question time comes. Thank you very much. So I will start with um, Olushego. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. Um, all protocols um, observed. Um, I'm very um, humbled to be part of this panel and be in this space. Um, a little bit about um, myself and um, the organization I represent. Um, I'm Dr. Lushe Gmutumusu. I am the HIV and Health Systems Advocacy Manager for the African Men for Sexual Health and Rights, which is um, an, an advocacy pan-African organization um, that tries to address um, access to um, HIV treatment and care for um, men who have sex with men, gay men, and also um, all the, um, the broader LGBTI um, group. So also lesbians, um, people, transgender individuals, and also um, intersex persons. Um, now, um, the conversation is around how do we um, ensure uh, resources for health? How do we scale up um, 
treatment and um, prevention for um, adolescents and young girls and the broader key population groups. Um, for me, it's all about, first and foremost, which was talked about yesterday, it's all about um, state commitment and it's about health financing. So we also all have to go back to the uh, Abuja Declaration, which actually um, uh, gives um, the state uh, which states have ratified. And uh, that is about the 15% um, um, allocation to health and health financing. And also, of course, under the Abuja Declaration, it's not only about the 15%. It's also about how a substantial amount of that money is meant to go into um, the multi-sectorial action for um, HIV treatment care programs. Um, so that is um, one thing. Um, also, there's no way we can um, mobilize um, health resources without um, involvement of uh, civil society, uh, without involvement of uh, community. Um, community and community systems are the people and they're, they're the um, groups that are totally in touch um, with the community and the people in the community. They have um, systems, they have the networks, and they have the know-how on how to um, use um, scarce resources in a sustainable way to um, you know, get the programs on ground. So this is very important. Um, also, even if you go back to the Abuja Declaration, there's um, a provision that talks about um, uh, involvement or government's been obligated to seek out uh, private partnerships. So that is also an obligation on governments. How are we uh, involving the private sector um, in these issues of uh, health, uh, mobilizing um, resources? Um, also around that is also about how we're going to tackle um, big pharmacy. What are we doing around um, patents, around um, generic, generic drugs? Um, especially when we're talking about HIV treatment and care, um, how are African governments, w with their scarce resources, how are they going to um, provide uh, drugs for their um, their people if uh, you know the big pharmacies have these huge patents that make these drugs totally inaccessible? So these are the issues that have to be addressed around um, mobilizing health resources um, for treatment and care and then scaling up uh, treatment and care. Um, it's, it has a big deal to do, again, with involvement of community. And it's not just involvement of community, it's about strengthening community systems. You know, a lot of the um, funding that we have have very little to do with um, uh, strengthening our community systems. Um, even recently, the Global Fund um, just cancelled some of the regional grants, which, um, in a way, were the ones trying to address um, you know, what the WHO units will call uh, the critical um, enablers. So we know that for any um, sustainable um, HIV response to work, uh, it's not only about treatment, which, the, um, of course, which is what the whole new craziness is about. It's about treatment, treatment, treatment we have to address the issues of the critical enablers. We have to um, address um, the punitive laws, the legal policy environment, violence, um, stigma and discrimination, um, and of course, back to community empowerment. Um, the sustainability of any HIV response lies with the community, lies with the civil society organizations working directly with the people. Um, if the, there's investment in the capacity um, strengthening of um, these organizations, definitely um, they will be able to do more around um, programming for HIV for their constituents. Um, so um, s there's no um, scale up of HIV uh, programs that will work without addressing our draconian laws. Um, in, if you look at Africa, of course, we have made gains. I would not dwell on the um, negatives. There are big gains happening. Um, a lot of countries now have um, uh, key populations, MSM, transgender people, and injecting drug users in their national strategic plans um, and, NSP and their frameworks. 
So that is a big um, deal. Um, also in the CCMs, although that is a little slower, um, there has been increased um, involvement of key population groups in the country coordinating mechanisms and also um, the key populations technical working groups. So we have to commend that. Um, some countries like Mozambique have um, removed the colonial laws around uh, sodomy and um, uh, punishment of uh, same-sex um, acts um, in their country. So I think that has to be applauded. You also have some countries that have um, rather ambiguous laws, especially a lot of the French colonies. Um, it's not clear what the actual law is around um, um, same-sex um, conduct. Um, and of course, um, I would also want to talk a little bit around the island countries, um, Mauritius, um, Seychelles, and um, uh, what's the other one now? Uh, Comoros, Madagascar, and all that. Um, they have some very good programs around uh, injecting drug use and um, uh, prove, um, uh, what do you call it, opioid uh, sub substitution therapy, arm reduction um, programs, needle exchange um, that are working um, in the countries. Um, and uh, I think that um, the other African countries need to learn from these um, island countries around their programs around um, targeting, injecting drug users. The same with um, sex work. Um, a lot of the African countries have um, sex workers as you know, um, the populations with the highest um, prevalence of, um, uh, of um, HIV, uh, and um, the issues are still not um, being dis um, discussed. Um, the punitive laws are still there. Um, well, there's overwhelming evidence from countries that have removed these laws, uh, showing that the HIV um, prevalences um, are dropping or have dropped. Um, so what exactly are we doing about this? And how do we want to hold um, our countries and our, um, our African countries accountable for, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we, we talk about 1990, we talk about um, zero discrimination, um, but the point there is that we have health um, services and health systems and uh, uh, what do you call it, health practitioners that still have um, huge um, attitude and problems towards uh, specific uh, key population groups. Um, we know that these are the things that drive stigma, discrimination, and actually uh, traffic uh, to these health institutions. Um, and uh, access um, for these groups, it's, um, you know, so those, those are the big issues that we have to look at, and uh, I think that countries um, will have to go back and rethink how they really want to um, reach their 1990 targets without um, addressing the um, key population groups that have overwhelming um, um, HIV, um, significantly, significantly higher HIV prevalence than the uh, general population. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will now ask um, Annabelle. Annabelle, I hope in your presentation you, you will indeed touch on decriminalization of HIV exposure, among other things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for allowing us to be here and to the organizers for inviting us. Um, for those of you who don't know SELC, the Southern Africa Litigation Center, we're a regional human rights organization. Uh, we focus on uh, human rights and the rule of law quite broadly, but within the mandate of our work, we have tended to, to invest a lot of our energies and focus into issues surrounding HIV, including concerns about key populations and women's uh, empowerment. Um, and I think a lot of our work is manifested in those program areas, and I'll give you some examples of how we um, perceive social justice prevention issues around HIV as manifested in some of the case, case work that we do. Um, so as a regional organization, I think we really perceive ourselves as partners. Um, we work a lot with civil society, community-based organizations, and lawyers at country level in Southern Africa to support using the law, using the legal process, uh, using legal analysis and using human rights advocacy uh, to advance human rights-based approaches to, to the issues that our partners are concerned with. And I'm happy to answer questions about our work if, if anyone's interested. 
Um, and just to give you a background, I'm the health rights lawyer at Salk. Um, and as a lawyer, my uh, very narrow legal thinking tends to frame some of my opinions on issues. Um, and I really invite your, your questions and perspectives on, on some of how we see these issues. Um, just to sort of start out, I think really if I'm looking at the Southern Africa region and looking at some of the amazing trends and progress that we've made over the years on HIV treatment and prevention, um, in the last year or so there's two concerns that I've really started seeing um, and that I'd be interested in unpacking a bit with you. The first, I think, is really that um, in the breadth and enthusiasm of the adoption of, of HIV scale-up in the 1990-90 goals, um, and in countries increasingly adopting uh, bold and ambitious test and treat policies, I've been quite concerned to see that in adopting these bold plans, the, the willingness to forego human rights protections, um, particularly around informed consent, um, and in around criminalizing uh, non-adherence to treatment uh, uh, and HIV exposure, transmission, and non-disclosure. Um, and I think that these are deep concerns from activists um, across the board who have seen over the years with the HIV epidemic how harmful coercive approaches can be. And at this stage where we've reached so much progress, um, the concern that it raises that we might backtrack on that progress by, by foregoing the hard-won human rights protections that, that have been the, the for, forefront of the battle of, of the last 30 years. Um, and uh, along that theme, the second sort of concern that I've seen raised is that through, through these sorts of trends, how we are tending to shift the burdens of health systems failures onto the individual. So where we are wanting to, to look at how to improve testing, treatment, and adherence, that instead of asking questions about vulnerability, about systems uh, deficits or failures, about accountability in cis health systems, we're looking at individuals, people living with HIV, people most vulnerable to HIV, key populations, and, and increasingly adopting punitive approaches towards people who, who most need our support. Um, so to give you some examples of how these sorts of concerns have manifested through our work, I'll just walk through some cases that we've done at Salk, um, and I'm happy to expand a bit on, on the work that we've done. So under my program, under the Health Rights Program, one of the key themes that we've been trying to follow is accountability within healthcare systems. Um, and we've been looking at how discrimination at healthcare level impacts uh, vulnerable and key populations and how we might use uh, quasi-judicial processes, complaints processes, to address some of these, these concerns. Um, another issue that we've been looking at through the lens of discrimination is particularly looking at access to healthcare in prisons environments. Um, we worked on the Tapela case in Botswana in uh, seeking access to treatment for non-citizen prisoners. And then I think this issue about migration and access to treatment for migratory populations as well as non-citizens is something that's quite a hot potato, yet despite the real um, consensus there is on a policy framework in the regional, uh, on, on regional mechanisms, that, that these are populations that really need to receive um, uh, collaborative treatment and care. Um, we've also been looking a lot at uh, conditions of imprisonment, and I think that this is something that often goes missing when we look at prisoners as um, key populations for both HIV and TB. Uh, we, we've been slightly better at enabling access to treatment, and we're getting there on enabling access to viral load testing, um, but we're, we're very, very, very far behind in the region on ensuring that prisoners have exposure to um, uh, conditions of imprisonment that are conducive to health. Uh, many of our clients are so starved in prisons in the region that never mind not being able to adhere to their HIV treatment. We've recently had a number of, of clients who've become psychotic due to starvation in the prisons. I mean, you can imagine the effects of that on a public health level when we're trying to treat um, diseases that are particularly prone to, to spreading in prison environments like tuberculosis and HIV. 
Um, lastly, we've done a lot of work over the years on HIV testing and treatment and on the human rights that we, we've been fighting to be observed in these processes. And some of these issues seem quite trite now in 2017, that we should uphold informed consent to treatment and testing. Um, and yet this is a, a battle that we find ourselves fighting afresh, um, particularly in countries like Zambia with its uh, a recent confusion over the po possibility of mandatory, mandatory tes uh, testing and treatment policies um, and under the auspices of Malawi's new HIV bill uh, that appears to introduce mandatory testing and treatment for certain populations. Um, but there's been a lot of litigation on this over the years across the region in southern Africa, notably the King Aipe case in Zambia. Um, but the, the consistent message that the courts have upheld is really just that it's undeniable that informed consent is an, a human right which obliges all healthcare workers um, in all aspects of, of healthcare access, in, in testing, treatment, um, and in any surgical procedure. Under our LGBT work and our work with sex workers' rights, we've really been trying to find ways to enable space for these vulnerable uh, populations and key populations to not only be safe, to exist as communities, um, but to be able to participate in um, uh, dismantling the legal barriers that, that prevent, um, prevent uh, these populations from, from accessing adequate treatment and prevention and enjoying their human rights. Um, so for example, we worked on the Legabibo case uh, in Botswana, where uh, recently the courts have upheld the rights of an LGBT organization to register. Um, and this might seem like a small victory, but I think for colleagues who come from Botswana, you, you might be able to share um, the immense power that this has created and space for LGBT organizations to, to actually speak out about um, what it means to be uh, an LGBT person in a community where you are unsafe. Um, and to, to lobby um, all areas of society. I see earlier we mentioned uh, religious leaders um, and, and to work with parliament and work with government on these issues. So, so having access to even just be registered as an organization for uh, organizations working with sex workers and LGBT organizations, this is very critical. And we also recently uh, won a very exciting victory in Botswana um, where the High Court has acknowledged the rights of transgender persons to change their gender markers on their ID books. Um, and this again is a similar thing that might sound like a small victory for you, but for transgender people to be safe, uh, to be safe from police abuse, to be able to exist in a public sphere and access healthcare services without discrimination, being able to present yourself as a person in congruence with what your ID book says um, is a very important uh, space opening um, measure. And we've also been working a lot on police abuse issues, particularly with sex workers, and trying to find out how we can remove legal barriers that expose sex workers to abuse. So one of the things we've been working on is looking at how some of the laws in the region uh, don't actually criminalize sex work or the sale of sex, but a lot of the activities around that. And so working with police and doing litigation in countries like Malawi to ensure that we interpret the laws for what they actually say and not further than what they actually do in, in ways that create um, vulnerabilities for sex workers. We also worked on a case in Malawi where um, police arrested and forced sex workers to undergo um, non-consensual HIV testing um, with view to prosecute these sex workers for um, disease transmission related offences. Um, and we won that case in the High Court that really affirmed that sex workers, like all human beings, have rights and have rights to informed consent and that the police nor, nor neither the police nor healthcare workers may force any person to mandatorily test for HIV. <coughs> Um, under our sexual and reproductive health and rights work, we've also been working a lot on expanding women's um, and young girls' uh, autonomy over their bodies um, and ability to access health care in accordance with their consent. So a key case that we, we worked on was in Namibia, where um, women were complaining of being, women living with HIV complained of being forcibly sterilized 
um, sterilized without their informed consent when accessing, uh, when, when uh, presenting themselves at health facilities during labor. Um, and again, the courts upheld upheld the rights of women to consent. And just lastly, one of the areas of work that we've been working on that I see as a topic in the discussion on women's empowerment is on women's land and property rights, really trying to expand the, the ability of women to, to um, uh, be socially and economically empowered to reduce vulnerability to HIV. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know if um, UNAIDS picked something uh, my uh, Annabelle said. She spoke about them lobbying for prisoners, especially illegal ones from other countries to receive uh, art in Botswana. Would UNAIDS then say the 1990 in Botswana was achieved by closing out illegal immigrants and, and everybody else who is not supposed to be there? Uh, food for thought, sir. Uh, now I'll call on Jose. Coach Jose will give us innovative strategies for prevention, I hope. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for me as well, it's, um, it's a great honor to be here. Um, so listening to the previous two speakers who clearly are advocates and, uh, and even lawyers in their, in their own right. So yesterday I introduced myself as an academic. Um, and I would say I would be an, an advocate for um, evidence-informed decision-making. Um, we heard yesterday that uh, we haven't ended AIDS yet, but that it is possible for us to do. Um, I strongly believe that um, evidence and evidence-informed decision-making is a key strategy in order to get us to ending AIDS. Because evidence can help us to understand what works, why it works, and, um, and how it works. So, Especially in the area of HIV prevention, I work for a program that looks at um, different research for HIV prevention for vulnerable groups. So it looks at strategies that we can implement for adolescent girls. It looks at strategies for service delivery for men who have sex with men. And it looks at strategies for HIV prevention in correctional facilities for prisoners. So there's quite a nice spread of those, but what they all have in common when we want to get that evidence into action is that it's quite a contested policy area. Uh, we sometimes call it politically sensitive, um, but it's, it's possibly less easy to get evidence to flow from kind of research into policy and into practice um, because of values, beliefs, societal norms and standards around adolescent girls and their sexual activity, around MSM and their sexual orientation, and around what happens in prisons as well. So evidence itself is important, and not so much the evidence per se, but the hypothesis that we work with is that good quality evidence can enhance the policy debates. So if your evidence flows nicely into the debates, those debates can, um, can be enhanced. If the debates are enhanced, the outcomes of those policy discussions will be better, which in the end can better the lives of the people um, that we work with. So in terms of this kind of opening statements of these panels, and I'm aware that we have five minutes and that there's a lot to discuss, but from the, um, the experiences that we've had within this specific research program, and I do a lot of work with the academics that we have in our program. And these are not small academics. These are big academic institutions. And I am always surprised to learn how disconnected the world of research is from the world of policy making. And there seems to be um, a massive barrier in trying to understand that those two processes and those two worlds can work, uh, can work together. So what I'm going to share with you as an, as an opening thought are three myths that I would like to debunk um, that we, we often share with our academics in terms of letting them come to grips with the reality of policy making. The first one, in that sense, is a myth around the thought that evidence is neutral. Um, it's not. So often we use it um, as, a, 
as a tool in the policy making processes. But one of the most important things for us to remember, and, and I think you know this probably much better than what I do, is that policy or lawmaking is never a straightforward process. It's messy, it involves a lot of different opinions, a lot of different views, and evidence is one piece of that puzzle. Um, so through rigorous academic um, research methods, we can ensure or assure you that the evidence itself is neutral. But as soon as we start engaging with it and we want it to influence those processes, it by definition is no longer neutral because we are engaging in kind of a political, uh, a political process. So it's important to remember that you know, the piece of research or the piece of evidence through its academic rigor um, might be neutral. What we want to achieve with it um, is an engagement process and that by definition is, uh, is not a neutral, a neutral ground. The second myth that I would like to share here this morning is around the fact that evidence is possibly best used to highlight a problem. And we see it often that, that we use evidence to kind of uh, point us towards where pertinent societal problems are. Uh, issues that, uh, that need to be put higher onto the political agenda and issues that require us to put extra effort and deserve more attention. But sometimes, um, especially as academics, we fall short in that way. We've highlighted the fact that there is an issue, that there is a problem, but we fail to understand that evidence is equally needed in coming up with solutions. So we work very hard to try and open up a space where there is room to say, okay, the issues around men having sex with men are important. But we fail to say, okay, these are certain strategies for the way forward. Those also need to be informed um, by evidence. So we try and force open those policy windows, but then we're not successful in actually leveraging them and making sure that we come up with solutions uh, that, can, uh, that can make a difference in the lives of people. Now the third myth, uh, and the last one which I would like to, to present here as, a, as an opening statement, is around that the real kind of success of research or evidence is measured through policy changes. Now whilst it's always nice to have a direct link between a body of knowledge and the way it translated into policies and into laws and into legislation. I think we forget that um, there are several different vehicles and processes that are put in place in order to better the lives of people. Policies are one of them. Programs and practices and service delivery are equally important processes uh, that can better the lives of people. And all those processes require um, evidence in order to, um, to understand why they work or why they don't work, how they should be improved in order to deliver better on, uh, on their results. So my message would be to not forget about policy influence with research, but to recognize that there are other uh, opportunities out there uh, for research to be, uh, to be used, and that is in programming and that is in practice as well. So I think I will, I'll leave it there. I'm hoping that we will have closing comments as panelists because there's some more things on my list, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next presenter will be Dr. Ines Innocent Moody Tsile, a senior advisor with the UNFPA. I'm hoping he will, he will talk more on the access to health services for the adolescents and in view of the legal framework where the age of consent has become an issue in a lot of cases, age of consent vis-a-vis -vis your right to health services. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and uh, good morning to honorable members of parliament present here. <coughs> Indeed, I come from UNFPA, which is uh, one of the UN agencies with the which has been mandated to address the issues of access to universal sexual and reproductive health. And in the context of HIV, we consider it to be obviously mainly uh, transmitted uh, through sex, has our, hence our interest. And we are particularly interested in the area of prevention of HIV. 
with a specific focus on women, young people, and those that are left behind, such as key populations. UNFPA is working with several governments in Africa to actually assist to contribute towards strengthening um, sexual and reproductive health, including HIV prevention. We have presence in more than 40 countries in Africa where we work with government, civil society organization, and other stakeholders uh, to help uh, promote national uh, development in various countries. <clears throat> In the context of HIV AIDS, I think our major concern as UNFPA is that we have not observed major progress in as far as prevention is concerned. Whilst the past 15 years we have seen a progressive improvement in terms of access to treatment, numbers indicate that when it comes to um, prevention, we have not done as much as one would have desired to. In 2016, uh, our heads of state and our representatives met in uh, New York and agreed uh, to end AIDS by 2030. And in that agreement, there was also an agreement that uh, in order for us to end AIDS by 2030, we needed to ensure that at least by 2020, we have a reduction in new infections by at least 75% as compared to 2010. When we look at the trends in most of the African countries, the progress in reducing infections have been not that great. So it's an area that I think uh, honorable members of parliament need to reflect and see how we could help shift the trend if indeed we are to succeed in ending AIDS. One of the major concerns that uh, we also have is that young people are disproportionately affected by HIV. We know that young people in most of our countries, uh, they constitute around 25% of the adult population that is 15 and above. But when we look at the rates of infection, we note that uh, um, almost 40% of those that are infected are of that age group of 15 to 24 being young people. But most uh, worryingly is that uh, the majority of them, 70% of the young people that are affected are actually adolescent girls and young women. Hence our interest and our focus on adolescent girls and young women. So on average in most of the countries, uh, young women are at least twice more affected than their male counterparts. The third area, I think, of concern that we'd also want honorable members of parliament to reflect on is that financing for HIV is still heavily dependent on external assistance, which actually uh, puts most of the African uh, governments in a very um, risky situation in case there are decrease in financial flows. And the, the, the fourth area is that even with that uh, funding being provided, the contribution to prevention still lags behind. UNA has advised that uh, in terms of distribution of funding, at least 25% of the funding for AIDS must go to prevention, but we note that for most countries, it's still much lower than that. So the question then becomes, uh, what, what, what could be done and what could be honorable members of parliament do? I think part of the challenge is why we have um, high levels of HIV among young people, especially adolescent girls and young women are to do with the legal environment. And members of parliament as champions in developing and shaping the laws in respective countries could actually do a lot. And one of the areas that we know that if we had political 
commitment it will make a difference is in the area of access of education for women, at least up to secondary schools. We know that young women who, go, who complete their secondary schools are less likely to be infected by HIV compared to those that are out of school. So basically by promoting uh, access to education and putting in place laws that will allow access to education at least up to secondary school will go a long way in contributing towards reduction in uh, new infections. As the Honorable Chair indicated also, there, is, there are also issues around age of consent that we think uh, lawmakers could actually give guidance to ensure that the age of consent is increased. In some countries, the age of con I mean, is decreased. In some countries, uh, age of consent to have access to basic services such as sexual and reproductive health and HIV testing is as high as 18, which makes a 14-year-old, makes it very difficult for a 14-year-old to have access to services without engaging their parents uh, to give consent. And we know that it's, it's very difficult uh, to do so. Another area where members of parliament could actually champion is basically the uh, comprehensive sexuality education to ensure that we use the opportunities that we are given by schools to empower young people with the knowledge to protect themselves. There is resistance in a number of countries to actually focus on comprehensive uh, sexuality education. And studies that have been undertaken in the African continent have reflected that actually a number of young people, they don't really know much about HIV, which makes it very, very difficult to get the necessary protection. So as a starting point, uh, Chairperson, we want to end thus far and we will entertain Thank specific questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my last presenter, and not the least, is Honorable Professor Ahmed from PAP. Honorable Professor, um, I'm honestly hoping that uh, since as parliamentarians, we actually passed the draconian laws that have now become an impediment to achieving the SDG goal, the HIV 1990 by 2030. What strategies, in your thoughts, could parliamentarians use? Is going to help the MPs uh, progress in their fight against AIDS. Today, there has been a meeting uh, under the chairperson of Aureli Singas, Honorable Aureli Singas, and uh, we have arrived at certain concrete proposals to advance. Uh, our agenda. What is the contribution that us MPs can bring to fight against this epidemic and to fight for the future of our continent? This would demand a total commitment and courage because we need to be courageous to take uh, a certain position in a society that is very conservative. Uh, AIDS cannot be considered in an exclusive um, uh, angle and uh, to be dealt with only medically speaking. There are certain aspects linked to this disease um, uh, that has a very great impact on society. And all of this has an influence um, and leads to stigmatization, discrimination, death. And we said, we said that we are not going to leave anyone behind. Fear of AIDS has a negative impact on the prevention of this disease and and it delays um, uh, screening and treatment for the patients us as MPs we need to have the vision of Madiba a vision that can must not be just a dream 
but it it is something that must be in our hearts what can us MPs do uh, we could initiate and pass laws to fight against these inequalities and ensure the well-being of people who live with HIV. We need to defend the rights of the population that are marginalized and excluded, especially women, the youth, uh, the sex workers, the drug addicts, um, and the migrants. And these laws, I will say that in Mauritania, we have voted uh, important laws. Well, it is not enough to just uh, vote laws. We need to apply them. There has a legislation that has been voted against discrimination, despite very um, difficult um, uh, debates. And we have legislated the age of marriage above 12, 14 years. And of course, we have set aside uh, significant budget lines to fight this disease. And uh, what we are also trying to do is awareness campaigns uh, to make the population aware of this disease. If we continue to work for peace, is if our states do not spend a lot of money on uh, weapons, arms, but for the development of programs to fight against uh, AIDS. And another important aspect is our economic development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will now open it to the public, to, to you honorable members. But before I do that, I have one small one. I'm going to ask first of all, uh, Ms. Dr. Badaras from UNH on Botswana and the closing out the uh, unwanted elements from the art program. But before I come to you, Dr. Badaras, there's something I wanted, I, I really, that came out from Botswana also on faith healers. I strongly believe that as a team, as fighters, as a group, as honorable members, as uh, partners, do not fight with the faith healers. Do not fight with people of God. Find a way of working with them. Two days ago, I, I was invited to a church, a big church, to present on cervical cancer. Bef after my presentation, the prophetess took the podium and said something that was amazing. She said, you have been told, when you go on a prayer line in a church, you come with your diagnosis, which was not given by the church. And when, when I say you are healed, remember there are certain elements that play is part, the, your faith, and the fact that the Bible says uh, God will heal the, the one, whoever he will heal, which means not everybody will be healed in this process. And then she said, when I say you are healed, you must go back to the person who gave you that uh, diagnosis. I never gave it to you. So if you are told you are healed by HIV, you must go back to the doctor, and the doctor will confirm that. Let's bring these big churches together. Trust me, Africans believe in their pastors more than they believe in doctors, more than they even believe in their politicians. I can't afford to fight against the churches in my constituents. I'm a goner. Because people believe in their pastors. So we, we have to bring them on board. So let's not fight. Let's find a way of, of using these good practices we pick somewhere else and say, but uh, pastors, we think this should be the right approach. We agree, God heals, but let's say, if I'm the one, you didn't diagnose this person, and God did not give you that skill to diagnose the person. I diagnosed and the person came to you. So return the person to me to write off the diagnosis, if it is so. Thank you very much. Dr. Badalas. Did I see him somewhere? I am here. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Thank you for, again, putting me on, on the spot. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I understand very well your question, and um, I'll attempt to respond. What we have been doing on 
the global report that we published in July is to look, of course, where we stand on 1990 and as I said, globally we are at 70, 77, 81, and we have been doing a scorecard country by country. And in our scorecard, there are few countries that stand out as good achievers, including Botswana, which had achieved 1990 globally. But what we have not done in each country, we have done at global level segregation by populations. At country level, we did not go to that detail. But what we know is that while we are achieving very good uh, progress on 1990, there are three populations that, have, that we see are left behind. These are the key population that are not as performing as, as well. It's the children and men in general. So I will be more than happy to go back to our data and discuss with the Botswana government and c come with segregation and share that with you. Thank you. I now open up for questions. My brother there then followed by Zambia. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Mine is a quick response uh, with regards to faith-based organizations to say that um, we do have uh, institutionalized advocacy in place. There is a network of uh, religious leaders affected or infected by HIV. It's called Inarela Plus, and that is a natural partner for the parliamentarians to work with and engage with because they are also in that area where they are trying to get the faith-based um, leaders to, to support the work that we are doing around the, the, the health responses that we have. So there is an organization, it's called Inarela Plus, and it, it is a natural partner for the parliamentarians. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. I would like to begin first by applauding the quality of the presentations from the panelists. I think that it has been uh, very useful uh, to feed into the deliberations that we are engaged in, uh, especially the presentation from the Southern African Center for Litigation, who are every day grappling with the issues that we continue to encounter uh, in our respective countries as we march towards uh, the defeat of HIV and AIDS. Um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, I'm not sure if the, two questions. The first one is with regard to key populations, in particular the prisoners or prisons. I'm aware, Madam Moderator, that uh, uh, the African Union, including SADC, have what, uh, what is known as the minimum standards for the treatment of prisoners, or sometimes known as the Mandela Rules. Uh, this prescribes the minimum standards through which um, prisoners are supposed to be taken care of, including their health. I would like to know how far these Mandela Rules have been domesticated into our prison laws. I mean, this goes back to what we said yesterday. We know what to do. Uh, we have always known what to do in order to ensure that we don't leave people behind. We, some, we have even crafted solutions. But how far have we gone in ensuring that we domesticate these uh, minimum standards for the treatment of our prisoners? Uh, that's the first question. The next question I would like, um, uh, probably it's UNAIDS, or I'm not sure who should really tackle this one. Uh, and this to me, is a very important issue because in the march towards the defeat of HIV and AIDS, I know that we are uh, marching on a global scale. And one of the things which I heard there is that most countries are actually adopting the test and treat principle. But there is also confusion with mandatory HIV testing which issue recently has happened even in Zambia. I think the head of state did announce that we are now going to mandatory HIV testing, which created an uproar. The Minister of 
health came and said, no, actually it's test and treat. So I would like, and there's a researcher there, and there's a, a lawyer there. First of all, for the sake of my colleagues, maybe I'm coming from the medical profession, I may understand the difference. But first, it's important that you point out the difference. And then secondly, why? Because I heard you mention that you actually won some cases in one or two countries where there was mandatory testing and the courts ruled that it was against human rights principle. So I would like to know, and ironically, <laughs> UN heads and the other development partners have been very quiet in our country to come out and give guidance clearly on this issue. I'm not sure why there was conspicuous silence. I know they know, I know they know the best practice, but there was some sort of silence in clearing the air over this issue, and it's important that it should be cleared, particularly to the MPs, so that even as we go to advocate, we can actually say that for me as a practitioner, I support test and treat. But from a human rights perspective, maybe I have issues with mandatory HIV testing. So what is the current best practice? Thank you. Muito obrigada, senhora moderadora. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Facilitator. I would like to greet and congratulate the panel members, panel, panel, panel members for the quality of their presentations. I would like to ask the uh, panel members at the level of PAP. We are 54 countries. I would like to know how many countries we, within PAP respect the groups of these key populations, uh, LGBT and uh, MSM. Some of the countries expel uh, LGBTs, and then they move to other countries in order to have access to treatment and also to have a dignified life, to live a dignified life. And we know that those groups represent a health risk uh, and if they're not identified, if they are not treated, we will in fact be uh, spreading the epidemic throughout society, the HIV epidemic. Therefore, I would like to appeal to the organizations that work uh, on HIV in order to reinforce further sensitization actions directed at uh, parliamentarians in the various countries, because the parliamentarians have the responsibility beyond approving the laws. They have the responsi responsibility to supervise uh, governmental actions, approve budgets of their respective governments, and and the parliamenta parliamentarians ought to supervise the international commitments in respect of these matters. Uh, you know, commitments assumed by the respective political leaders. I would like to give you an example here, the Cape Verde example. We are, are already in the third uh, uh, mapping and uh, study of uh, HIV prevalence within the, in the general population, but also in the, uh, those key, key groups. Uh, those. Uh, as generally, Cape Verde has a prevalence rate of less than 1%. We are on 0.8. That's, that's the national uh, uh, prevalence rate. But the aggregated, uh, OK, with, in the men, it's 1,8 and women, 1.4. So within the key groups, key populations, it's 7,7. Uh, uh, in, the gr in the other group, HS 15%, and UD 6.9. So we have a, a concentrated epidemic in, in, in these particular population groups. Therefore, we need to know the type of ep epidemic we have in our country so that we can work with the respective groups that require more urgent attention. That is a, an issue that worries me, which are the clients of the uh, sex workers and the LGBTs. Unfortunately, there's a lot of hypocrisy uh, within the political class, we have a lot of clients of the sex workers and of the, uh, who are people who, who, with the 
high positions in society, some of them are politicians, but who do not, in fact, in fact assume uh, and declare their, their, their responsibility. Sometimes, in fact, they uh, assault uh, uh, sexually these, these, these uh, vulnerable groups, uh, uh, forcing them to have intercourse without the use of condoms. In Cape Verde, we are undertaking a very interesting work, which I would like to share with you, which is with the peer educators. It is the actual sex workers together with the civil society organizations who are working with their clients in order to sensitize the clients because many of them do not are not aware of the consequences of, of the HIV and AIDS. I think this could be an example that perhaps could be shared with other countries and in order to avoid the contamination so that we can reverse uh, uh, the, the, the trend of the, the spread of HIV and AIDS. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Please can we shorten our presentation so that we allow more people to, to engage. The lady in red. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. I want to thank the presenters for the good presentation. Uh, however, my question goes to the gentleman from UNFP. He has talked about the roles that they play, especially with adolescents. But um, the biggest problem he has not talked about, especially about the youth who are being born with uh, HIV. In my country, uh, it's now 36 years ever since the AIDS problem came in. And I'm assuming that uh, the youth from one year to 36, they are those who are born with HIV. And it's really a big problem because some of them have been had, uh, have resorted to taking drugs. Some of them are very frustrated and others have even refused guidance and counseling from their parents because they are living in a denial situation. And counseling such children who were born with HIV together with those ones who were, who were just infected or through sexual and what is really hard because the other ones they live in denial, they keep blaming their parents why they affected them with AIDS. And in your presentation, you did not mention anything to do with uh, children born with HIV. I think it's a very serious problem which needs to be tackled alone because country over, these children have become a problem. And if we don't handle it in a serious way, most of them are going to, to, to live a miserable life because they are living in denial. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the lady here and then Madame Cote d'Ivoire. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator, and I would like to say thank you very much for the presenters. And uh, I need some suggestions or ideas about uh, the attention which is given for the prevention, awareness, or everything done on HIV and AIDS. Um, I, am, I am afraid that the, the attention given before, like five or ten years, and now is not the same in my observation or even in my country, which some uh, studies shows that. So uh, we did very nice uh, thing before, like 10, five years, and the attention was too serious. But due to the, the, the improvement of the condition, we are, uh, we are not giving the same attention. It is not uh, continuous like the previous one. And some studies, especially in my country, in Ethiopia, shows that it's growing again. It was declining due to the activity which was done before, but due to the attention that we are in safe and we are improving on that ideas, the attention is not the same like before. So it, is, it shows some increasing uh, uh, statistics. So do you have a study on this issue and what is going on now? Um, as a general in Africa or uh, like in a region that you are presenting about in the southern, uh, the south uh, region. This is um, s some uh, idea wh which I need to get. What is the, 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 pa the pattern shows 
which was done before. I appreciate what you, you present that we have to do on education, especially on girls' education, which is very important. And it is, it is a success story in my country, too. That is, early marriage is very uh, damaging, uh, which is transmitted for transmission of HIV and AIDS. So what is your suggestion, or if you have some studies on this manner? And I want to say, in shortly say that in my national parliament, HIV and AIDS is a cross-cutting issue, like gender, environment, and the other uh, cross-cutting issues. HIV AIDS is included in a cross-cutting issue, and it is oversighted by the committees, on, not only in the Ministry of Health, but in all ministries, what all ministry is doing. And it is checked always. Thank you. Merci, Madame. Thank you. Je voudrais à mon tour. Thank you, Madam uh, Facilitator. I would like um, not to ask a question, but just um, uh, contribute uh, when we come to uh, the young women in uh, adolescence and uh, um, HIV transmission. I believe that in our different uh, states, we have to include in our education curriculum, because it is in that environment that you have um, adolescents that we may have uh, um, HIV prevention program uh, to teach um, the children that you have to um, keep yourself safe and uh, um, because we do not really uh, control our children. We do not know exactly when they become sexually active. Uh, so we have to include in our education uh, curriculum um, the HIV prevention uh, for young people. You know that in our states we have uh, two types of young women, those who have been to school and those who have not been to school. Of course, we have some literacy uh, programs where we uh, teach them how to read and write, but we also need to include in those uh, literacy programs um, programs on uh, HIV AIDS uh, prevention for uh, young women. In our states, we do have uh, uh, centers of uh, training and uh, learning, and maybe in those uh, uh, centers we should teach these uh, young women, these young married women, uh, mostly those who are going in those centers just to know how you can uh, keep your house. And uh, maybe we should add at that level a number of uh, prevention uh, programs or modules on HIV AIDS. This is what I wanted to say um, on uh, uh, prevention means for uh, adolescents and uh, or teenagers and youth. Um, now, I for the MPs, I believe that other partners like uh, UNAIDS and others should work directly with uh, structures um, that have been uh, established that will allow them to work directly with the MPs because when they go through uh, ministers, sometimes the resources do not get to their intended targets. So it is important that we uh, come with such uh, a structure, and maybe I will uh, then speak with um, a chairperson of the committee if it is possible to interact directly with the MPs because they are ready to work on HIV prevention. Thank you. there in at the back and then South Africa thank you very much for the very uh, enlightening uh, presentations just a few separate points on the child marriage I'm, I'm certainly noting that there's a lot of emphasis put on laws and I think that's obviously a role for um, the parliamentarians but I think even when the laws if we are successful in changing them um, there will still be child brides 
who are still living in situations of gender-based violence. We're working with a project in, Mala in Zimbabwe where there's also cases of multiple partners. So that means the husbands are going off and, and, uh, and g being unfaithful and bringing back AIDS uh, to the women. So I think we, we can't forget um, that constituency. With the migrants, I think also um, in areas, uh, the women cro informal cross-border traders are having to engage in uh, transactional sex to get across the border and I think it would be important to look at the men who are engaging in uh, those uh, transactions and allowing that to happen because also you get into multiple partners where the women go back to their partners and, and the AIDS is transmit, transmitted. On age of consent, I think it is important to look at what's happening in South Africa. I do hear the point about looking at um, a particular age, but South Africa has introduced a law that recognizes that two to if the youth are similar ages, they should not be criminalized. So I think we have to be very careful about the types of things that we propose and that they're not too generalized. And finally, on research, I, I do appreciate that we need to valorize academic research, and I think it's critical, but it's expensive, and it often involves outsiders undertaking the research. And I think there's more and more discussion, particularly as, as the SDGs are placing greater emphasis on the need for data, that we need to look at ways to get evidence that has come directly from the front lines, from youth researchers, there's work being done by VITs with sex workers that is given the same legitimacy. Otherwise, we're never going to get all the evidence we need if we're reliant simply on um, academic research. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to posit the fact that everything we have been discussing here needs resources for actualization. And Africa has plenty of resources to fund all their projects, but through resource capture, Africa, African countries are popularized and will remain so until they learn how to shepherd their resources and use them for their own people's well-being. If we do not prioritize science-based education, we will not be able to develop our resources. If we cannot or are unable to develop our resources for our own well-being, others will, with know-how will capture these resources and use them for themselves. Our life expectancy will remain low while the mobility and mortality will keep on rising because poverty is the principal driver of ill health. The President Becky Retired Commission, through any competent legal structure, should be mandated to pursue and bring back the money that was illegally siphoned out of Africa. Africa must shepherd uh, well its abundant resources for the benefit of its people. This may just help to inject the muscle needed to carry out the necessary projects that will enhance the people's well-being. If we want to win the game, we must write the, the, the rules of the game ourselves. And until the lion learns how to read and write, the story of the hunt will always be told from the perspective of the hunter. You know? This makes it imperative that we must learn and invest more in quality education to acquire the know-how. This truth are self-evident. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Sessions, and then Mauritius, your neighbors. Thank you. I think it is important, I can say essential and necessary, to address the social, political, and economic inequality that drives the epidemic and restricts certain groups to access to information. Support. By addressing the structural condition of the epidemic, it will help reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. It will reduce the discriminatory attitudes that exist at service delivery, either if you are a man or diverse sexual orientation, either if you are straight, gay, lesbian, or bisexual. I think that by 2020, we should be done away with stigma and discrimina discrimination and move forward to close the gap. And our focus should be on reducing the epidemic by 2030. I feel that a lot of effort is needed to change society attitude. 
so that all individuals, including the lesbian, gay, sex worker, prisoner, and even the sexually active elderly in the home to gain access to HIV treatment care information. As we say, we should leave no one behind. And as one panelist said in his opening statement, we need to empower the community. Let us find ways that the information, treatment and care for HIV would reach the vulnerable. Because these vulnerable were not born vulnerable, but they were made vulnerable by society that have marginalized and exploit them. So it is the duty of us politicians to sensitize the, the society, to reach out so that we can care, we can reach out to these people that are more vulnerable. Okay, in Seychelles, we, are, we have started the methadone program in prison. As the percentage of hep C is very high in prison, we have started giving out condom in prison. The needle exchange program is working well, but for the needle exchange program in prison, there, it is still an ongoing discussion. The issue has not been brought yet to the, to the parliament. We have to think back if, that when you are sentenced in prison, there are certain rights that is denied as a prisoner. So we, we have a hitting debate about if we are going to give the needle exchange program in prison. And let me be guided by the panelists so that you can help give some idea if it is a good idea to have needle exchange program in prison or not. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Let me first of all thank all the panelists for their interventions. Uh, I just said that uh, Odo Musso, uh, which uh, was just intervened, uh, I can say that he was right saying that uh, the small islands uh, like Mauritius are uh, doing well in the preventions program, arm reductions program. And I can say that the uh, needle exchange program as well as the methadone substitution therapy are contributing to reduce the new infections, mainly for drug users, sexual workers, and the men having sex with men, which are in fact the key uh, affected population. But I must also say that the grant from the Global Fund covers only 20% of the country financing needs to the national response. So in order to sustain and support NGOs working in various fields, such as health, education, environment, etc., a 2% tax on private companies' profit, which is known as the Corporate Social Responsibility Tax, has been put in place. But anyway, we need in Mauritius to increase our national efforts to improve prevention, treatment, care, and support. So in my humble opinion, if there is a political will, we can surely achieve the three times 90 units target. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll take my last uh, two. Oh, okay, my last four. <laughs> Let me start with uh, Mabuza, then uh, Zambia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, Madam Moderator, looking at the ways to ensure um, that resources are made available for prevention and the treatment for HIV and AIDS, uh, one would like to um, state the issue of the need of strengthening the health, the, the primary health care in our respective countries. And uh, two, on another note, and looking at how best can we scale up our health promotions? Because uh, I see most illnesses that we uh, get in our respective countries, it is due to lack of knowledge in our communities. So 
I suggested that if we can just look at how best can we strengthen up our health promotion, our, our, our primary health care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Let me also join uh, those who have commended, I think, the quality of their presentations. You know, excellent uh, presentations, which we appreciate. I think the messages are very clear that um, uh, as members of parliament, uh, in the area of social justice, we should pay close attention uh, towards the understanding the special circumstances of various communities, especially those that are marginalized, those that are vulnerable, uh, in particular the migrants, the prisoners, uh, sex workers, those uh, transsexual communities, and so on. This is very important uh, if we are to realize inclusiveness uh, in various programs. And also, also the importance of data, you know, to understand, you know, those special circumstances, and paying special attention to laws that are discriminatory, and also uh, looking closely to how well, you know, funding is being targeted uh, to such, uh, you know, uh, special communities. I think the critical issue here is that. Um, uh, our parliamentarians across the continent, are they really um, in tune with those marginalized and vulnerable you know, communities? Have they cleared their stereotypes, the stereotyping in their minds towards you know, such communities? Uh, what work has been done by international agencies like uh, UNFPA and uh, UNAIDS to enable parliamentarians clear out of their minds the stereotype thinking towards these marginalized and vulnerable communities so that uh, if they are thinking as parliamentarians, they look at them as communities needing their attention, as communities that really require uh, the, the attention of parliamentarians uh, in their work. I think we should start from there. Let's start from there. That is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now give to Catherine and Rose, respectively. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I think another area that we might want to look at and the honorable MPs to really get engaged on uh, is the area of conflict situations. During conflict, especially young girls and women are impacted very negatively as far as HIV uh, AIDS is concerned. Uh, apart from that, uh, even those who are sick already tend to disrupt their treatment, uh, tend to sometimes have changes in their treatment. Uh, during intervention and interaction, between peacekeeping forces and receiving communities, there are certain uh, transactions that sometimes end up worsening the problem. So I think one of the areas, if you look at countries like uh, Central Africa Republic, yesterday we were also listening uh, about the issues in South Sudan. I think these conflict situations, we need to take uh, them into account. I also think that there is a linkage that can only be really exploited by honorable members of parliament because they cut across the entire continent. They're countries that are out of conflict. They have a way they've dealt with such issues. So it's not as if we are starting from scratch. We can have that cross learning between countries that have emerged from such conflicts 
so that they can also support countries that are in conflict and uh, vice versa. So I thought that that's an area that we should not uh, lose sight of. Thank you. And there are also already international commitments, like <coughs> there was a resolution 1983 that came through the, the, the Security Council that needs to be implemented, the resolution 1983 that needs to be implemented across our continent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank you um, for this session and would like to use this opportunity to just clarif um, offer some clarification from the comment that came from the Honorable Member of Parliament from Zambia, um, uh, stating or inquiring as to whether why UNAIDS and, uh, and uh, everybody else was quiet around the um, statements that were made around the mandatory HIV testing. In fact, um, the UN system, WHO, UNAIDS, and the rest of the system were present during um, the launch, which was um, really to launch the, the HIV testing and the test and treat guidelines. And the head of state uh, mentioned the mandatory testing, although it was um, not in the statement prepared by the Ministry of Health, as we were informed. Um, shortly after that, um, uh, after that announcement, um, UNAIDS and WHO together released a press statement um, basically um, outlining and saying categorically that WHO and UNAIDS do not support mandatory or compulsory testing of individuals on public health grounds. We are aware that Zambia has been in, uh, implementing provider-initiated testing and counseling. Um, since 2008, and we applauded this initiative at the, of launching the new HIV testing campaign to basically reinforce the wish to have universal access to t treatment and get many people knowing their HIV status in line with the 5C principles. And the 5C principles under WHO and UNAIDS are consent, that there has to be consent, informed consent, there has to be confidentiality, meaning you don't go shouting about people's results once the test is done, that there must be some counseling, that's the third C, that the results must be correct, so correct test results, meaning that if, for instance, the first test is positive, that there must be confirmation of that test, and it's not automatic that after one test it's confirmed, and, uh, and the, third, uh, the fifth C is that there's connection to a care su support, support center or referral center. So those are the five Cs, consent, confidentiality, counseling, correct test results, and connection to, to, to care. The only mandatory testing that WHO and UNH support are for screening of donors prior to all procedures involving transfer of bodily fluids or body parts such as artificial corneal grafts and organ transplants, and secondly, screening for HIV and other blood-borne infections of all blood destined for transfusion or for manufacture of blood products. Those are the only two indications where UNAIDS and WHO support uh, mandatory testing, and that's usually in the laboratory somewhere. But in terms of the HIV testing campaigns that you're doing, um, we need the, the five Cs apply. But this, this, this information really, the fact that UNAIDS and WHO actually acted at country level, reinforces for me the message that clearly the UN system and others are not engaging enough with parliamentarians directly. I think the message that is coming out clearly is the assumption is that if you talk to ministry, Minister of Health, then things are known, or the Minister of Education, or the Minister, but clearly, I think the message for us as UNAIDS is to go back and tell our UNAIDS country directors and the UN system at country level that engaging with especially on the health matters that we're talking about, or gender, or disability, that we need to engage with the parliamentary committees directly. And so we take that back um, as, as a lesson learned, and we'll put that in action. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just add one little question, which I think needs to be answered. Uh, I don't know if there is data, actually, especially on K-pops. I know we have data on uh, prisoners, 
and HIV, and we know we have data on sex workers and HIV. Do we have data on transgender? Do we have data on gay? Do we have, do we have or bisexuals? Because if a uh, MP is going to advocate for something, saying we are not leaving someone behind, you may be asking in Parliament, who is that person we are leaving? How bad is the situation? Is it worth bothering about? So we, do we have information? I'm sure. Thank you, and I, excuse me, Chair, for um, moving in on your seat here. Um, I just wanted to respond to the Honourable Member from Zambia's question about um, minimum standards and, and whether uh, countries in Southern Africa at least have adopted, domesticated these. As far as I'm aware of the countries in Southern Africa whose prisons regulatory uh, laws and regulations I'm aware of, none have adopted the international or sub-regional minimum standards. Um, to the extent that a number of the judgments we've had, the courts have actually commented that the regulations that are applicable to prisons, um, food and uh, overcrowding, etc., are severely outdated. Despite that the regulations in countries like Zambia and Malawi are so outdated, um, we still see uh, an inability to comply with the, the regulatory requirements. Um, and with that, I would really just emphasize two things that I think are emphasized in the international um, uh, standards. Um, the first being that of transparency and oversight in prisons. Um, it would be great to domesticate these standards, but unless we have independent oversight of their implementation, unless we have independent access to prisons, unless we have independent data generation on HIV prevalence in prisons, I'm afraid uh, the standards will be nothing but paper tigers. Um, and the second issue I would just mention where I think um, on implementation of these standards where Parliament might really have a role to play with prisoners is in, in br bringing ministries of health to the, to the table on, on uh, health service provision in, in prisons. A number of the prisons where we work, um, prison uh, heads of prisons are having to decide on a daily basis how much of their budget to spend on medicine and how much to spend on food. Um, whereas prisons, prisons, prisoners are citizens, they should be provided with the same healthcare services as community members do. Um, and so I think in terms of both budgeting and responsibility allocation, uh, uh, the prison services are often um, victims of the failures of ministries of health to, to play the roles that are actually prescribed in legislative environments. Um, and then I just wanted to respond on the, the test and treat issue, and I think that the confusion between um, what was mentioned as provider-initiated and routine testing, which of course is a wonderful thing, and um, between that and mandatory testing, which we, we would severely um, argue against, is exactly what's driven um, some of the... the uh, uh, ambivalent responses even from civil society in, in Zambia on this question. Um, and I think for a lot of activists, uh, we are often concerned that when we have these announcements of mandatory testing, it gets coupled with announcements of test and treat, things that we've been fighting for, things that we need, and um, expansions of access to testing. And so for us then at that moment to criticize mandatory testing becomes very, very frightening. We're scared that we lose the gains that we've got. But indeed, the, the regional legal consensus on the fact that informed consent must apply to HIV testing and treatment is undisputed. The international legal consensus is undisputed. And, and in fact, there's a beautiful judgment in, by the Zambian Supreme Court um, that really links the importance of consent in healthcare environments to a democratic value, um, to say that the state cannot infringe on your body um, and that instead we should be looking for enabling environments where, where patients trust healthcare care providers to consent. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, for the questions. I think I'll go with um, Dr. Roots, Honorable Dr. Roots. Uh, question first, then I'll just make um, comments on some of the issues that um, were raised um, from the floor. Um, for um, data, you know, data is um, all about um, providing evidence for uh, programs and evidence 
to um, government um, policy makers and, pal and parliamentarians and on um, um, broad issues. And this is supposed to help with them um, taking decisions that will affect um, their constituents. Um, for um, data on um, key populations, um, a lot of um, funding um, over the years have gone into um, in, um, integrated um, biobehavioral um, surveillance um, um, studies um, um, per country. Um, uh, and this, of course, has also involved um, many African countries. Um, a lot of the information that comes out from this uh, behavioral studies have showed um, prevalence rates um, amongst particular uh, key populations that we have mentioned, uh, MSM, um, injecting drug users, or people who use drugs or people who inject drugs, and uh, uh, what you call um, transgender people and sex workers. Um, so the overwhelming data has always shown f um, the range from between four to five to even 10 times more than the general population in uh, prevalence rates. Um, that having been said, um, some countries actually, uh, for their own political reasons, actually um, sit on some of this data because they don't want it to come out and um, just deny that some of these populations exist. Um, I, I, I'm not going to mention some, some of the countries, um, but it, this is the reality in Africa. Um, there is evidence, and some countries actually sit on this information. That way, they don't have to address um, the um, issues um, in their countries. Um, so yes, there is um, data. Uh, some of the data are not well disaggregated. So for example, you could have um, some countries um, having a mixed data of uh, uh, men who have sex with men, gay men, and transgender people together in one uh, data set. So um, there's also the issue of disaggregation of data. But just to mention some positives, there are some countries that have moved a little bit ahead. So it's not, there's a study, actually this was in Malawi, that compared um, prevalence rates um, in general population um, looking at geography and the, um, the um, prevalence rates per, um, in a geographical fashion and compared it with um, um, prevalence rates um, amongst um, um, MSM, also with the geographical spread, especially when we're talking about PEPFAR and um, issues of impact and even the Global Fund, like, okay, we're putting our money where uh, the HIV um, prevalences are higher and because we want you know, more um, bang, um, bang for a buck. Um, it is quite clear um, the total difference in where um, the HIV prevalences um, were amongst the general population and amongst um, the key population groups. So that is another way that, especially we're talking about um, utilizing our scarce resources and putting where, putting the money exactly where we can get um, more results. We have to start looking at um, uh, not only um, blank. Um, data um, um, prevalence rates, we also have to start looking at where exactly is the HIV um, uh, emanating from um, in a geographical um, fashion. So that's a little bit of how we can also use some of our data. Then I'll make um, um, and some comments. Some, um, there was a comment from uh, um, Seychelles. Uh, around uh, needle exchange uh, programs um, in uh, prisons. The point there is that a, um, <laughs> the, the places, so a pri uh, yes, what happens with a prisoner is that they are, they innately they have their human rights. It's just that they are confined to a space. Um, I think that it's, it's sad that countries don't understand that per you having a population of people in a confined space, you can actually do a lot of work with them. You can do a lot of studies with them. You can gather a lot of evidence around um, prisoners because they are just a population that you have access to. Um, when we talk about sex in prisons, it's not um, a myth. This is reality. 
So I don't understand um, why there's still resistance around condom programming or lubricant programming in prison. This is a reality. It will happen. Um, and on drug use in prisons, the prisons are um, spaces whereby drug use is at a very increased um, um, uh, height. It is happening in prisons. There's nothing you can do about it. It is happening in um, prisons. The hepatitis C um, rates in countries that have looked at um, 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 the hepatitis um, epidemic is always significantly higher in prisons. So definitely there's a lot of sharing of needles um, happening in prisons. There are also other um, ways um, 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 you could have, um, you know, okay, for example, you could have um, somebody telling you that, okay, I don't share needles, you know, um, I always use my own needles. But the point there is that there are also other practices that could put that that person has significant risk. So if the person, for example, is having withdrawal symptoms, there's a um, practice called flash blood or um, blue suit, whereby they will actually request a blood, um, the blood from somebody that has already injected, and take the blood from the person and inject the blood into themselves just to have, um, um, or at least they feel it gives them the feeling of you know, withdrawing their, um, um, addressing their withdrawal symptoms. So that is somebody not even sharing needles. This is his own needle, but he's collecting blood. So we have to have this knowledge around how people actually can have HIV. It's not just one way. There are different ways people actually could have HIV. So even addressing needle exchange programs, that's not only where it ends. It's also about how can you actually transmit it? Thank yeah. Thank you, uh, <laughs> you Chairperson, and um, thank you, Honorable Members of Parliament, for your um, comments. I will uh, react to a couple of comments that were raised. <coughs> there was a reminder that, indeed, when you look at adolescent girls and young women, it's not the, the transmission is not only limited to sexual activity, that some of them were actually born with the virus, and that is quite correct. <clears throat> um, we know that historically, um, um, before PMTCT programs were um, highly advanced, there were a lot of transmission that took place 15, 20 years ago, and those people are now adolescents or young people, and they actually acquired that uh, through uh, mother to child transmission. It then actually supports the point that uh, we need to ensure that we promote comprehensive sexuality education so that we empower all young people to be aware of different modes of uh, transmission and also how best to uh, uh, protect themselves. Going forward and with uh, lots of advancement in uh, uh, prevention of mother to child transmission, I think we'll, we'll see that number actually decreasing over time of those that uh, get um, transmission through that mode. And more will be really around uh, sexual uh, activity that uh, contribute to that. So that's why we need to think of ways in which we can arrest that trend. <clears throat> I also agree, concur with Honorable Member of Parliament from Ethiopia that we have observed over time uh, a fatigue of some, to some extent, that uh, the energy that we saw 20 years ago, 15 years ago in responding to HIV has tended to, to decrease. And that has been observed and it has been more visible in prevention area. Um, I think Ever since the introduction uh, of treatment, there was that feeling that all is, is fine. But I think we're beginning to realize that uh, all is not fine. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of um, re-energizing. In the context of East and Southern Africa, there's been a lot of an attempt to actually remobilize people to address particular issues of uh, uh, prevention. And I'm glad to say uh, next week there'll be a gathering, a global gathering, to actually mobilize political leadership, civil society organization on the prevention agenda. Uh, and hopefully that will shape uh, and energize 
uh, all countries to take issues of prevention more seriously because we know that treatment will not be sustainable if you continue to have uh, more cases of uh, HIV. I also want to concur with Honorable uh, Member of Parliament Mabusa that uh, indeed it's important that uh, we integrate HIV in primary health care. Initially, it was quite critical to promote HIV as a vertical program at the initial stage to actually build the necessary uh, awareness of the dangers and stuff like that. But now we're at a stage where I think there's global consensus that integration is the way forward. And I think uh, more and more we'll see HIV being integrated in various uh, programs uh, at primary health care level. There was also an important observation that was made by my colleague from UNAIDS that uh, issues of humanitarian, of conflicts are quite critical. Um, I recently read a report on one of the countries in the continent, and I was shocked that uh, actually after two years, the people who were defaulting from treatment was like 50% after two years, and is a country actually in a humanitarian uh, setting. So it's an area that uh, we need to pay particular attention to. We also know that uh, in areas of conflict, issues of gender-based violence are quite high, which actually contribute also to uh, increase in, uh, in uh, HIV infection. Lastly, I also want to concur with the observation that has been made by um, our regional director of UNAIDS, Catherine, that it is quite important that uh, we find avenues to engage more with uh, members of parliament, both at regional level in terms of uh, structures that are there at continental and also at country level, so that uh, they could play their critical role of making sure that appropriate policies are in place, of making sure that allocation of funding in parliament is appropriate to the needs of the people, and also making sure that their representational roles are reflected. I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me come uh, clean here. Uh, I did mention that I'm an academic. I didn't mention I'm an academic or an advocate for academic research. Um, I mentioned I'm an, an advocate for evidence-informed decision-making. Those two are very different things. Um, I do think that evidence plays an integral part in the roles of Parliament in terms of oversight, in terms of representation, and in terms of lawmaking. There are very different forms of evidence which all need to be balanced. The academic research is one of those types of evidence that you can use in your processes. On the other hand, there's data and statistics. For instance, your HIV estimates or your national surveys, those generate data. Then very importantly, there is what we call practice-informed knowledge from your own experiences in terms of what works. From programming, from implementation, we know what works. And then there's citizen knowledge which also needs to form and flow into your decision-making processes. Now, balancing those is a difficult act. But in order to come to evidence-informed decision-making, those different types need to be balanced. If you have too much academic research in your processes, it becomes very technocratic. If you have too much data in your processes, you end up in a situation of analysis paralysis because you can't make a decision, there's too much. If you have too much of your citizens' knowledge in your processes, you get populist decision-making. You also don't want to go there. So it needs to be a balanced picture. But that said, in terms of academic research, it doesn't necessarily have to cost a lot of money. And I do believe, and from the program that we have, there are very well-qualified academic institutions in the countries in our region. This to just make an assumption that academic research is foreign and comes from overseas is incorrect. Uh, we've got strong academic institutions in South Africa, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Malawi, in Zambia that we are working with in this program that are delivering excellent quality research. So it doesn't necessarily have to mean because it's academic, it comes from, um, it, it's an external product basically in your, in your processes. What I think members of parliament can do in, uh, in this regard is to engage with those who generate 
the evidence, to do that early and to do that continuously. Now, I do recognize that often the engagement, especially with researchers, there's a, there's a bit of a mismatch. You might need information in order to make uh, decisions. They're still busy analyzing it. Um, or it takes, it takes too long in order to find common grounds. So instead of focusing as, on that as the only avenue for you to get your hands on the evidence that you need in order to make the decisions, I would recommend that um, there is a focus on you as members of parliament demanding, you can demand in different areas to get support in terms of capacity. There is uh, support in terms of capacity for evidence-informed decision making. So that you capacitate your teams, your portfolio committees, and your structures within parliament to search for evidence, to synthesize the evidence that is out there, to interrogate it and to make the decisions. So that dependency um, on that kind of supporting role for you becomes much less. Uh, and I would think that um, that could be a way to move, uh, to move forward. Another area as well where you can get involved is around setting the actual national research agenda. Because those are processes that take place uh, in your countries and getting involved in setting the research agenda is a way for you to influence the evidence that is going to be generated that is going to feed into your, um, into your decision making processes. Lastly, I wanted to respond to the issue of HIV-positive adolescents, the ones that are, uh, that are born HIV-positive. Um, within the adolescent portfolio in this um, program that we have, we've got one of the largest cohorts, the world's largest cohort of uh, HIV-positive adolescents. And um, the study is a joint venture between the University of Cape Town and Oxford University. Um, it's called Mzanzi Wako, um, and they are following this cohort in a longitudinal study, so they've been following them for years, trying to understand their risk, trying to understand the factors that influence adherence to medication, and trying to understand different support systems that can be put in place in order for them to mitigate the risk, uh, understanding they are adolescents, and adolescents themselves come with certain risky behavior. Uh, but trying to understand what can happen in order to mitigate those risks. So I would um, encourage you um, to come and I can share the details uh, of that study so that there can be um, a flow of information in that regard as well. Thank you. I do not have any question. I have certain comments concerning compulsory screening. Uh, this is, we cannot um, uh, advocate um, uh, compulsory or mandatory screening. And we cannot as well contaminate people um, willfully. Uh, this is a criminal attitude and uh, it affects society. We can certainly proceed with uh, screening as long as the person consents. And if, and if a pregnant woman consents, uh, we can do a screening. The Doctors attending to these pregnant ladies should ask whether they would agree to screening. I would like to come back to, uh, to the rule that was mentioned by Madame Facilitator. As you know, uh, the, in Muslim countries, uh, the religious people have a different attitude. First of all, we should not say that they always play a negative role because they speak about faithfulness and uh, that is a way to fight the, um, uh, 
to fight HIV and AIDS. But uh, they refuse to do uh, to advertise condoms because they believe that it is sinful. And they do. And of course, they have a very negative attitude towards prostitutes and those that suffer from AIDS. So the approach here of prevention and uh, sensitization uh, actually depends on each and every community, every society, and social context. You know, in my country, which of course is uh, in majority a Muslim uh, country, uh, alcohol is forbidden if you can go to prison just for uh, taking alcohol. Of course, um, people do uh, take alcohol but uh, it also means that uh, there's no um, sex worker that is uh, officially declared. Um, of course, even um, uh, gays uh, are not coming out. They are hidden. Uh, so the approach here is quite um, uh, difficult when you come to uh, uh, the parliament, there are a number of issues that you cannot talk about, like uh, sex workers. Uh, so we need a different approach. We can try to um, uh, sensitize um, people that do understand by using NGOs to um, target these uh, key populations and see how to bring care uh, to them. Uh, there are a number of things that are not um, um, illegal, like prostitution or um, homosexuality. But I would like to come back uh, to um, another point that I said earlier and that was also highlighted by uh, the colleague from Zambia, and um, that is on education. And, Number one, we need to uh, train medical doctors on uh, how uh, to um, uh, really take care and deliver on HIV and AIDS. We do have an issue of uh, human resources uh, in Africa and um, uh, medical doctors that can really uh, deal with that uh, situation, a uh, uh, few. So we really need to um, get involved in that area that our universities um, do uh, something about it. Um, we need uh, some HIV and AIDS uh, training uh, over and above the normal medical um, training that uh, our doctors uh, get, like said uh, my Zambian uh, colleague. In Africa, we do have uh, the resources. We are the continent of tomorrow. But if we do not have the knowledge and if we do not work towards acquiring uh, knowledge, it will be difficult. Uh, for us. How can you uh, accept that in my country we may have uh, gold mines, and uh, but we only get about 5% in return of uh, those uh, extractive industries? Uh, but uh, if we had uh, African engineers that could have um, done the exploitation, I think everything could have come back to our own continent. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank my panel, my panelists, and thank you. Give them a pom pom, and I release them. Uh, in an effort to for us to finish our program, I would want to say we move on instead of going for tea. We move on and invite Dr. Shoni Pile Mabuza from CDC, so that she quickly takes us through the evidence-based prevention data on HIV. Dr. Mabuza, while she's coming, you can intervene there. One minute. Oh, no, it's okay. While she's setting up, I, want, I just wanted to tell parliamentarians that even though the legal framework is not very, no, you can come, it's not very user-friendly. 
You can go around it. All these legal frameworks are just hypocrites in Africa. You can really go around it. Zimbabwe, for example, the president is known of ha having said uh, a gay person is like a dog, but the president, Banana, from Zimbabwe was a gay. So what does that mean? I will not mention other countries, lest they get there and be arrested. Thank you. Continue my, you are ready? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good morning, honourable members, and uh, all protocols observed. Um, as the Madam Chair has already said, my name is Dr. Shon Pile Mabuza. I'm from the Centers for Disease Control. I work there as the TBHIV lead. Maybe just to correct the title of the presentation, I'm not here to talk on HIV prevention data. However, I'll be talking about tackling the burden of uh, TB and HIV as uh, we were requested by the African Union. And thank you to the AU for the invitation. And also before I start, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues from the Global TB branch who are based in CDC Atlanta, who worked with me in putting together this presentation. I know it's, I've been allocated an hour, but I'll try to compress my presentation because I see we've run out of time. So just to, okay, I'm not sure what's happening here. Okay, so this is the outline of my presentation. I'll just quickly take you through the background, the global TB bedding as, um, it's indicated in the Global TB report of 2016, and then touch briefly on the problem of multi-drug resistant TB, and then hone in on TB-HIV collaboration, and end off with just a few areas where we've identified opportunities to collaborate. Okay, by way of background, I'm sure we do know that TB remains one of the top 10 causes of mortality worldwide. And in 2015, TB surpassed HIV as the number one infectious killer globally. And we heard yesterday from the director of UNAIDS that there is, it will be a futile exercise if we manage to put all these patients on treatment, but we allow them to die from TB. And in our Africa region, TB and HIV are syndemic, interacting synergistically, contributing to the excess burden of disease on the continent. We all are aware of the sustainable development goals and the NTB strategy goals that have set ambitious targets, as well as the UNAIDS goals, the 1990-90 by 2020. And, uh, we know that it's not, uh, to achieve these ambitious targets, there is a great need to prevent and control not only one epidemic, but forces that drive the dual epidemic. This is just a, oh, I think I've pressed. <laughs> uh, no, this thing is misbehaving now, so I'm not sure. I haven't touched anything, it's just going on its own. So I, I hope the guys at the back can see. <laughs> it's just, I'm not even sure what's happening. Okay, so this was the slide I wanted to move to. So in terms of global TB burden, as of 2015, uh, WHO estimated that globally there were about 10.4 million TB cases, and of those, 41% were not notified. That means they didn't make it to the healthcare system. Therefore, they were not diagnosed, and they were also not treat treated. And then in terms of drug-resistant TB cases, there were about 580,000 cases estimated, of which more than 70% did not reach the health facilities, therefore did not receive treatment, and that talks to continued transmission in our communities. Um, WHO, what they've done is they've put together the 30 high TB burden countries 
globally. And if you can look at this uh, slide, it shows you uh, the, the, the high burden countries in, in TB as well as MDR TB and TB HIV. So what I wanted to show from this slide is that African countries make about half of the countries among the 30 high TB burden countries. So that should tell us that about the problem of TB that we have on the continent. And also this is a map showing the high rates of TB in the Africa region. The, the darker shade of green is the estimated number of cases that are in excess of 300,000 cases per 100,000. So you can see Africa is very dark green there. And also the, when we talk of convergence of HIV and the TB epidemics, the darker shades of blue are also showing where we see in excess of 50% HIV co-infection rate among TB patients. So again, Africa is very dark blue. And then moving, um, Sorry about that. This it's not easy to manipulate the slides from here. Okay, so with this slide, I just wanted to show graphically the estimated number of deaths from HIV and AIDS, TB being the bend at the top and HIV AIDS at the bottom. So clearly you can see that TB is killing more people than HIV. I'm going to skip this because we will need internet connection to talk about these slides. So uh, just moving to the next uh, section of the presentation, which is drug-resistant TB. There is consensus that DRTB is a global health emergency. I've talked about the number of cases that were estimated in 2015. And maybe just to draw your attention to the last bullet, which talks to extensively drug-resistant TB, it has now been reported from 105 countries. So that should tell us that this is a, 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 a growing problem. And they have just attached two articles for people's reference. But the one article was, uh, the study was done in KwaZulu-Natal right here in South Africa, which found that the transmission of extensively drug-resistant TB in South Africa is mainly driven by person-to-person -person transmission, not necessarily uh, a failure of uh, a treatment or poor adherence to, 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 to treatment. So this is just a, a, a graphic to show that the, the black dots are perhaps the index patient, and then you can see the networks when it comes to transmitting XDRTB from person to person. And looking at the high migratory flow in our region, it is a no-brainer that this problem will not be just limited to South Africa soon. It will spread to the rest of the, the African continent if it goes unchecked. So I've already talked to this, that uh, the drug-resistant TB epidemic is largely driven by transmission and not so much acquired drug resistance. There's still major gaps in diagnosis and, and treatment which contribute to ongoing transmission, as I've already alluded to in my opening slides, where WHO reported an estimated number of 580,000 cases of drug-resistant TB, and 71% of those didn't even make it to health facilities. So there's a need for a greater understanding of where transmission is occurring so that we can better target our interventions. We, need, we also need better tools for measuring impact in hospital and community settings. This is just a picture to show where confirmed XDR TB cases are global in terms of numbers, and I've already mentioned that South Africa seems to be the epicenter of this epidemic, but I've also talked about the porous borders and the high migratory flow in our region, so I'm sure in a few years' time other countries will be reporting high levels of XDR TB if this goes un 
challenged. So moving right along to TBHIV collaborative activities, which is mainly the title of the presentation. In 2004, WHO published the interim policy on collaborative TBHIV activities, and this was followed by the guidance which was published in 2012, mainly to assist member states on how to tackle the dual epidemic of HIV and TB. And it had three pillars, which talks to coordination, but I'm more interested in the second and the third pillars, where the second pillar is talking about reducing the burden of TB in people living with HIV and initiating early antiretroviral therapy for those that are co-infected, and then also reducing the burden of HIV in patients with uh, diagnosed with TB. So how, maybe you might be asking yourself, because this is an HIV AIDS uh, meeting, so how does TB HIV contribute to the UN AIDS 1990-90 goals? I'm not going to talk about those because we've been hearing about the 1990 goals from since yesterday. So what I want to perhaps show from my next slide is that by testing TB patients for HIV, we are actually contributing to the first 90, which is about identifying all the positives. And we've heard from the UNAIDS representatives that um, in terms of the 1990-90 cascade, we are at 70% for testing, 77% for antiretroviral treatment and 83% in terms of viral suppression. So if we want to improve from 70% to get to the target of 90%, we have to make testing TB patients for HIV our business. And then looking into the second 90, initiating the TB HIV patients on ART is also going to help contribute to the second 90. And lastly, uh, to attain viral suppression, it will not be easy if we have cases of undiagnosed TB and therefore not treated, because we know that undiagnosed and untreated TB results in detectable viral loads. So in those patients where we might not be seeing viral suppression, the reason might be that they have undiagnosed TB. So it's very important that we intensify case finding, we screen patients for TB at every visit and then get them on treatment so that we can achieve the 90% and also put uh, PLHIV on TB preventive therapy because data has shown that that actually reduces the risk of progression from HIV, from TB infection to TB disease. So this is also just a, a simple bar chart to show PLHIV in new TB cases and TB deaths. So, and TB is the leading cause of death among PLHIV, and in 2015, PLHIV accounted for 11% of all new TB cases globally, which is the yellow, the small yellow bar on the right hand, on the left hand side, and then, okay, that's my left, and then also, Globally, I mean, the highest was seen in the WHO Africa region, where it exceeded 31%. And coming down to the Southern Africa region, we're seeing um, co-infection rates in excess of 50%. Even though uh, HIV contributed 11% to the, 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 the TB burden, when you look at TB deaths, HIV, uh, TB, HIV accounted for 30% of all the TB deaths. I'm going to skip this one because we've already talked uh, briefly about it. So in terms of performance, how Africa is performing, I just have uh, data that is slightly outdated from uh, up to 2014, but this uh, Charts is meant to show the percentage of notified TB patients with known HIV status starting from 2004 to 2014. So you can see that the Africa region, in terms of the trend, we've been seeing an upward trend, and we are actually testing more in proportional terms. We're testing more patients than other regions outside our continent. And then uh, this is just a, a trend in terms of ART initiation among notified HIV positive TB cases. So Africa is on the right trajectory. We just need to do more to get to the 90% that we are aiming for. 
this is also a, a slide. Okay, this is actually animated. I must show the next one. So it shows ART coverage of estimated HIV positive incident cases again over time. And I'm sure you'll recall uh, in the beginning that I talked about missed TB cases of those that are estimated about 40% are not reaching health facilities. So if you use those estimates, we are actually missing 63% 60 of our TB HIV co-infected patients. Those are the patients that we would be putting on ART. I also talked about TB preventive therapy, which is going to assist us with attaining viral suppression in our patients, because this is an intervention that has been shown to reduce uh, progression of TB infection to TB disease among PLHIV. This is just a, 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 a study that was done, a trial that was done, which showed that 37% reduction in TB mortality in PLHIV was attained after six months of receiving IPT, which is the same as TB preventive therapy. And uh, just to show uh, how Africa is performing in terms of TB preventive therapy, South Africa is actually the biggest consumer of uh, TB preventive therapy globally. And this you can see from the orange uh, line that South Africa is actually uh, contributing to the uptake of INH prevent. But you can see that the rest of Africa is also on an upward trend. I'm going to skip this slide. Okay, or maybe I should talk about it. This is shows IPT coverage again in the WHO Africa region. Even though South Africa is putting more patients on INH preventive therapy, but you can see that in terms of coverage, in terms of the people that were eligible, we only managed to put 38%. So Ethiopia is taking the lead in terms of coverage, but on the numbers, it's not that high. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about TB infection control, which is one of the key components of the NTB strategy and the collaborative TB HIV activities. The risk of transmission is high in healthcare and other congregate settings. We've, talk, we've had a, a lot of discussions around prisons and other congregate settings might include your army barracks, etc. And healthcare workers are at greater risk of TB infection and disease. And nosocomial outbreaks, nosocomial means outbreaks in hospitals, hospital acquired outbreaks of MDR and XDR TB among people living with HIV are well documented. On my right is a, a compilation of newspaper articles that went out around 2006. Some of you might be aware of the first outbreak of XDR TB in South Africa and where we had 53 patients diagnosed with XDR TB of whom all of them were co-infected with HIV and 52, 52 of them died, more than 90% of them died from XDR TB and it was found that the transmission actually happened in health facilities. So we need to do more to protect our health workforce by strengthening infection control measures at health facilities and congregate settings. I'm almost done. So the question is how can we achieve epidemic control? We think we can get to zero through the following. We need to find the missing TB cases and put them on effective treatment. We also need to test all TB patients for HIV and get those that are co-infected on ART, provide TB preventive therapy to all eligible PLHIV. We need to ensure implementation of infection control measures in health facilities and all congregate settings. And also the threat of DRTB is real and primary transmission is driving the epidemic. Therefore, we need to make sure that we give it all the attention it de deserves. So what needs to happen? I am aware of the audience here and we've, I've heard many people talk about the powers that you have in terms of influencing 
policies, laws. So we need to become bilingual in our programming and also in the discussion. We need to move beyond greetings because where we are, I'm actually quoting um, a director for DGHT, CDC, Atlanta. She said these words at the IAS conference in 2016, where she said, right now we're still at the, the greeting stage when we talk about the dual epidemic. We need to go more deeper. We need to have more nuanced conversations about how to tackle the dual epidemic of TB and HIV. And also to quote the words of uh, Madiba, we can't fight AIDS we can't fight AIDS unless we do more to fight TB. So getting to zero entails fighting the TB epidemic as well. And also we've talked about financing. So the cost of infection, the cost of action might seem high today, but the cost of in action will be much higher further down the line. So we need to act now, and now is the time to do the right thing to save future generations. So that was my last slide. I thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Shonipani. I must, I, I want to say something. In my introduction, I did not mention that I'm the Dennis uh, to be using advocate. We have been to PAP here and we are raising funds. I'll tell you, I want to thank UNAIDS. I was sitting here thinking, is UNAIDS planning to hold such a meeting and not even may deal with the issue of HIV and TB? That, that uh, coexistence. I, in the last meeting, Rosemary is not here, I referred to it as the neglected twin, that is TB. It is a twin of HIV, and you cannot separate it. In my country, what I did, I made so much noise to a point where uh, the National AIDS Council was actually officially made the sub-recipient for the TB from the Global Fund. The reason being, because it is an institution which has built because of the AIDS levy, they have a infrastructure, they have, they have systems. So we then put it, mandated them to ensure that they drag along the neglected twin, who is TB. So I must thank you. Catherine, let's do this more. Let's act now, because our success, especially the 90 of saving the immortal, of not dying, we will not achieve it if there is some other disease killing you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I don't know whether there are people, people with questions or clarifications. It was a straightforward uh, discussion indeed, and we have been here at the pub to discuss the issue of TB and HIV. I'm sure the health committee people will remember that. We even asked them to move a motion. I'm not sure whether it was moved or not. Any comments? How, my MP? <laughs> hmm? Yeah, well, Bob. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it's very difficult to engage um, on a topic that is so research oriented like yours, uh, with statistics and analysis and so on. Um, I'm trying to see if you have a way of packaging um, the data in a simpler form, yeah. in a more animated form, mm. um, because a lot of people struggle to, to, yeah. to, to, to interpret and emotionally connect with it's such true. kind of reports and analysis. But also, in terms of um, language, um, what, what kind of options are you working on? Is it only in English that you work or whatever? Because I think for the MPs or, and civil society in particular, uh, it will also be important to consider such aspects. Um, the data is not useful or the research outcome or is not useful unless there are people like civil society, um, parliamentarians and so on, and other stakeholders who are able to use it for advocates who are able to use it to lobby, to engage the government, and so on. So we need to find a link between the research and the uptake of it. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I should share something from Zimbabwe in that respect. What, what uh, the National TB program did in Zimbabwe was to, say, first of all, really grill parliamentarians the committees on health and HIV and gender 
on, on the issues, symptoms of TB and other things, and how to case find. And then it allowed MPs to, and, to go back to their constituencies and say to their communities, if you are HIV positive, insist when you go to the health facility for them to check you on TB. In other words, you are, you are telling MPs to say, tell your people at a cons at community that if they have been diagnosed with HIV, they should insist on saying, does this mean I have TB? The minute you ask that question, you are allowing for a further investigation in your case. So we can simplify, don't worry about all those big words. You can <laughs> and also maybe to, to mention that uh, uh, the, there is an element, something called uh, TB resistance, which is resistant to drugs. This is why you may find yourself on one year injectable drugs. We, I agree with you, we must simplify it. Kenya has done it. They have a simply nice brochure for parliamentarians. And Zimbabwe is working on something. It's important, especially the linkage between these two. Mm. Okay, thank you for, for that. I think it's a comment, it's, it's not much of a question. And I totally agree with you. We had a, a discussion around this with the, the team from Atlanta, and I actually raised this point to say we need to also understand our audience, mm. such that when we prepare the message, we must tailor it for their level of understanding. And this is what I'm going to take back. I think also the title, in a way, because it was focusing more on data evidence. So we sort of stuck with the, 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 the direction from the AU, but I entirely, I, I agree with you entirely. I had, we had prepared some slides which were very interactive in terms of showing the bedding, but uh, we were let down by the, the system upstairs, so that's why we couldn't project that. And it's, that's actually quite animated. It could, it was, I thought that was the best way to, to present this. So yeah, we'll take that and I will give feedback because they are anxiously waiting to, <laughs> to hear feedback because I think it's the first time we are actually doing this. So it's, it's very helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I would like to thank Dr. Shlonipani. Oh, there's a hand. There's no hand. Wait. No, there's no hand. Thank you very much. I want to, th to thank Dr. Tlonipani. And also remember, I think we have, um, we have discussed this issue with parliamentarians quite a lot. So I think they are away. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk to you. Yes. Uh, the next stage is something I do not think I can do myself. So I would want to call on the organizers to come back to their table, probably Catherine and the who, who else, because it's about a follow-up and strate strategic parliamentary action. Uh, and Rosemary has run away. Uh, Savelo is nowhere to be seen. She's following the future president. She could, he could be the advisor to the... Honourable members, this is the last one, but I think we need to thank uh, Honourable Ruth and give you a hand. Thank you so much. Um, we, we have some few action, action points that are really coming from the audience, that are coming from you, that you are going to read out. These are action points that um, will constitute the outcome of this meeting. Uh, it will also, you can also look at it as the commitment. So if you want to work, make adjustments here and there, please go ahead, but we have a, a Honorable Lunguz here, uh, who is going to read out a document, an outcome document that we refer to as 
uh, well, the strategic actions, the parliamentary strategic actions, is actually an, an action plan. Thank you, uh, Your Honor, for being available to read out this. Thanks, Abelo. Pleasure. Salam. Afternoon. Oh, is it? Oh, it's still in the morning. No, it's in the afternoon. <laughs> okay. So, as Sabelo has rightly put it, this will form as a guide for us to see how best can we domesticate the actions that we have done here. And I'm sure this is the beginning of a network. We can also call on our friends to say where do we want to clarify and where do we want to make it better. So on the thematic area of leadership, advocacy and accountability, we are saying let's create for opportunities for enhancing the capacity of MPs and parliamentary committees. Our colleagues from the NGOs, you're here, one of the NGOs and say, so one of the things we said as parliamentarians is, yes, we know what to do, but sometimes we don't have the capacity to put all the information together. And even some of us, we don't have assistants who can do it. This is the role that we can take up. Advocate and monitor the implementation of achieving the 15% the 15 of the Abuja targets. Within the region, very few countries are doing it, so we are looking at this as an action point. Enact laws on national health insurance and community health care. We have lessons from other countries that are doing well, Tanzania, uh, Rwanda, let's learn from each other. Conduct peer-to-peer -peer sharing of country uh, best practices among members of parliament. This is part of the network. Remove punitive and age restrictive laws for accessing HIV and health services. We had good examples yesterday. Monitor the implementation of enacted laws and establish an inter-parliamentary forum to monitor the implementation of resolutions, decisions. Let's take, let's take use of the e-world that we are living in to see how best we can advance this agenda. I think all of us, we can learn one or two from there. Under health financing and sustainability, we are looking to conduct oversight on resource allocation, assess whether resources allocated to healthcare are sufficient to meet state goals, push for efficient use of resources, make sure our ministers are accountable to us as parliamentary committees, and advocate for innovative and diversified solutions to finance health, including expanding the fiscal space to generate revenue for healthcare. We are saying health, it's development, it's not only a social issue. On access to medicine and commodity security and universal health coverage, UHC, we are saying advocate for government and African institutions to support implementation of the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan for action. NEPAD is there. Let's use this institution. Advocate for enactment, enactment of law on national health insurance and community health care. And actively advocate for universal access to medicines and health care. On prevention and social justice, focusing on HIV and TB, and I'm sure we can also expand this to any other condition that we know is prevalent in our, in our setting, we need to advocate for revitalization of HIV TB prevention at community level, promote equitable non-discriminatory health services, advocate for good governance and resource allocation. We know good governance is quite a big issue in our states, so this is something that we need to push, and our CSOs are here to help us on this, and focus the intervention at a, at a family through door-to-door -door mobile. Door to door model. We can't ignore the family unit in whatever we do as parliamentarians and as partners. And on the partners, we have a list of partners there. We have the AAU that is there, we have NEPAD that is there, PAP that is there, UNAIDS, UNFPA, WHO, UNDP, UNICEF, REX, CDC, private sector. I think as a, as a region, we're not utilizing the private sector a lot. This is an opportunity. Let's see how best we can do it. We're looking at various development partners, the civil society, and partners to support national, region, and continental parliamentarians with materials and resources to perform their advocacy work, including strategic information, build capacity of parliamentarians to understand drug production and pharmaceutical, in pharmaceutical issues, including trips, an analysis of financing and efficient use of resources. And I'm sure even within here, 
we are saying some of us we miss out on the you know uh, we miss out on some of the information on the best practices that are happening in other countries. So in a nutshell, these are the broader areas that we have agreed on in the uh, thematic areas that we discussed today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable, for that eloquent presentation. I will request on the outcome document. Uh, we, we will open the floor for that, and then we'll take the input and improve the document. I see a hand from the Gates Foundation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first, uh, I just wanted to, uh, to thank me as a representative of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation here. Um, I really, I, our name wasn't listed on the partners at the very end, and I just wanted to just pledge that, um, that our foundation would like to continue to partner um, with uh, all of you in in kind of our global and combined and coordinated efforts to uh, address both HIV and TB. I want to also thank um, to say that um, I'm just honored to to meet a form uh, a future president. So I'm happy, really, very much for for that. Um, I wanted to just uh, reiterate a couple of things that were was in the kind of the, the summary that which I thought was really excellent and if we're able to really accomplish even a portion of the things on that list we will really make um, uh, a lot of significant progress but one of the points with respect to HIV that was made by President Matlante is the importance of just prevention in general that we cannot uh, really solve this issue of controlling HIV just with uh, the improvements that we've made just on treatment alone. But I want to make the point that the 90-90-90 goals that we've been talking about the last uh, two days, and especially the second two 90s, are focused on treatment and that as a global community we really need to develop prevention targets too that are as easily understandable and integrated into our programs as the treatment goals are. And so I wanted to um, emphasize or reiterate a point that was made by uh, my UNFPA colleague just now about the, this global prevention coalition that's being developed now that's being led by UNAIDS and UNFPA um, that will really popularize the importance of just uh, prevention. And just underline that in that global HIV prevention coalition, um, UNAIDS and others have identified five pillars for prevention. We've talked a lot about two of the pillars, um, which includes focusing on key populations and aspects of leadership but three other pillars that we haven't talked about in the last uh, day and a half include the importance of condom provision and promotion, um, the importance of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, and also voluntary male circumcision. So circumcision is being proved as a method to lower um, uh, HIV transmission. Uh, there's an uneven kind of, um, kind of uh, progress on that with countries in East and Southern Africa. That's, so these three additional provisions, uh, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, voluntary male circumcision, um, and uh, condoms are important components of our, com our HIV prevention response. Um, I think that the, the last presentation on that included TB um, also kind of emphasize the importance of countries developing national strategic plans with respect to HIV and TB prevention and treatment 
and then monitoring and adhering to those, those uh, plans. And this is also an area I think that parliamentarians can, um, I think, play a role in, in interacting with their ministers of health, ministers of education, ministers of finance, and others to understand what these strategic plans are and then seeing how they're really being uh, implemented and um, uh, popularized and implemented. And it relates to a point that's, uh, that also we've talked about, which is having um, countries be in the leadership of these plans and having donor organizations be supportive in not doing things on their own. And so I think that that's uh, kind of an important thing to emphasize. So lastly, I just wanted to, to say that just like um, uh, the regional UN AIDS uh, director, this has been just a very informative uh, learning experience for me, and it kind of emphasizes, I think, the need to involve and for us to kind of uh, target parliamentarians as critical kind of uh, partners and leaders um, in country AIDS uh, and TB responses. Um, so it's something that I hope that we can collaborate and work uh, on with you in the future better uh, because um, just in the last day and a half, I'm just learning more and more about the importance of uh, working both with parliamentarians in, on a country level but also one thing that might be added to the list is working with the health committees and the staffs of, uh, of parliaments uh, because parliamentarians may change. Um, I hope you all don't change necessarily, but um, there's a need for ongoing staff support for new parliamentarians that, that come in that may change. Um, so that's in addition to um, capacity building of parliamentarians, but institutionalizing the, um, the ongoing kind of capacity of parliaments to um, support new um, parliamentarians that come through. But I just wanted to thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me, and this has been just a very important meeting for me, and I've learned really a lot from it. Thank you very much. Yes. Clapping of hands is a big thank you. Honorable Ruth. Uh, just a small one. I really strongly feel that the AU need, needs to make a stand. You need to insist on the Global Fund to say every African country that has a CCM, and they must incorporate parliament in that. Because we sit in parliament and talk about a, a budget of... Uh, uh, 100 million for health when four or 500 million has been given elsewhere and you don't know anything about it. And then uh, you, you, you have no control. And then they turn around and say, no, 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 no. The global fund said we can't do this when you're trying to say, can that money go here? So you need to sit in the, in the CCM in Zimbabwe. Two committees sit there, two people sit there. The Committee on Health is a substantive member of the CCM. The, com the chairperson of the HIV is a substantive CCM member. So we are involved from A to B, and there's a lot of capacity building going on in the CCM. Right now we are on e-learning, and that helps every CCM member, and it, which means you translate that knowledge to parliament also. I think e, you must demand that from Global Fund, that it is replicated in all African countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. And we've made note of that. We will reflect that on the outcome document. I saw a hand. Swaziland. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, uh, Chair, under prevention and social justice, I'd like to suggest a need to add um, the strengthening of primary health care uh, systems. Strengthening of health care. Strengthening of primary health care systems. Yes. We will see how we frame that point so that 
is uh, relevant to the institution of parliament? Yes. Um, I think it is the role of parliament to look at making sure that people at the constituencies or at the community level are getting information about HIV and AIDS. So in that regard, if, I, if we are talking about prevention, and if we stick on the point prevention, I just look at it fitting because if you say you strengthen the primary health care systems, I mean that the ministry, as, just like myself, I'm the chairperson of the Minister of Health, in, of, the, of the Health Portfolio Committee in Parliament. I think it is our role to see it to it that the ministry does it. And the ministry has got a promotion, a health promotion officer who is dealing with those matters right at the ground, right at the ground level. Thank you. Thank you. Well noted. Uh, Molokele. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just one or two or three points. Um, the first one is, um, I'm not sure, maybe I missed it on the, pres on, on the presentation from the Honorable uh, Future President. Um, <laughs> I'm a good neighbor of Malawi, don't worry. Um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, the point around the discriminatory laws that are a common experience across Africa, uh, uh, are the parliamentarians taking a stance to advocate for the amendments or repeal of discriminatory laws against keep populations, LGBTI sex workers? Is it something that they are, they, they are pushing for? If so, it, it needs to come out clearly that they, they will make every effort across Africa to put an end to these laws that are leaving others behind. Um, the other point was around the embracing of new technologies uh, to, to support the, the response because the, 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 there is less investment in Africa, especially compared to the Western world, in terms of focus on research that improves our response. So new technologies for health to embrace um, the research that is being done, that the options that are available apart from uh, scale up or prep and all those kind of things, but also vaccines and so on. Um, so that's an area that I would want to encourage parliamentarians to push their governments to focus more on. Uh, then the last but not least, I, at the end of the, of the document, I didn't really get a clarity in terms of uh, the practical engagement between the Pan-African parliamentarians and the stakeholders um, beyond the meeting today. Um, what's they, what is being put in place? in terms of engagement, both at a continental level and also at a country level. From a civil society point of view, I'll, I'll be happy to have clarity because I'll also share with my networks on how they can take this matter beyond the conference of, of improving and enhancing engagement of uh, Pan-African parliamentarians. So um, um, is there a system in place in terms of follow-up, in terms of ensuring that the resolutions or the outcomes that have been read out will be implemented and uh, monitored in terms of progress. Thank you. Well noted, thank you. Ethiopia. Thank you. Um, I think we, we, if, uh, we can use the strategies that uh, taking this HIV AIDS and TB issues as a cross-cutting issue in the oversight and the legislative process of the parliament. It has to be included in all sectors to, to check whether it is, there is there improvement, is there a budget, proper budget for each uh, these activities. So the parliamentarian has to include uh, in as a cross-cutting issue like gender. For example, in my country, that gender is a cross-cutting issue. Uh, environmental protection is a cross-cutting issue. HIV AIDS is a cross-cutting issue. And it is included in all uh, activities in the oversight and the legislative process. So uh, this can be uh, used as a strategy to, to improve the condition. And the other thing, if this is the other one, is the, the, the suggestion whether it is working or not, I'm not sure. But if 
there is a, a workshop or a training here. So what is going on? What is the, the, the impact for the future? So we, can we make some committee or a follow-up body? How this is uh, going to practice and to evaluate uh, the, the, the process or the result? So making and make some best experiences, choosing some best experiences from different African countries and sharing these experiences to, to bring Africa together. So can we use this strategy again? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. Well noted. In the absence, oh, I see a hand here. Mauritania. Um, in our health committee, we volunteered that when we will get back home, uh, we will share the documents concerning our deliberations. Can we have these documents, please? Yes, Honorable. Mr. Savello, thank you very much. And of course, like I always start is to thank the, uh, yourselves, the African Union, the African Union, the UNAIDS, and of course, PAP, who have facilitated this very important workshop. Uh, we have looked at the action points. I think they are very important. Uh, but I still going in my mind, I am still trying to to figure out or to find a forum under which I could learn or other countries could learn the experiences of Zimbabwe, Ghana, and probably Rwanda, who have moved in trying to put some of the recommendations that we have put there in terms of the levies, in terms of the social insurance, in terms of empowering communities. And I'm just wondering whether it is not possible for a small study group to that effect to those three respective countries. Thank you, Mr. Sabelo. Thank you very much, Honorable. I, I saw a hand from the generation, eighth free generation. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabelo. Um, I am not a champion. Uh, I am their, their tool. Um, the champions are very, very excited about this gathering. Uh, that is why one of them and, and one of uh, their significant uh, member was here to do the opening. They are not only interested in just coming over and doing the opening. I have been requested to report back to them the proceedings, your conclusions here, and how you want to move forward. The reason being that they want to provide their full support to the outcomes of this engagement. Uh, as a result, uh, they would want to know or see whether there's any roadmap that is going to come out of this and what kind of support this grouping would want from them. Either at this level that is uh, uh, continental uh, and also at the level of countries. Those that have had interactions with the Champions Program know that in every country that they have visited, they have sat down and engaged with the parliamentarians, the different caucuses in Parliament itself. And also they have had uh, engagements with regional fora and body where parliamentarians have convened engagements. And that is where I got to know in a little bit more detail, Dr. Labode, and also even at, at global uh, forum where there are parliamentarians. So parliamentarians are very, very key to the work of the champions, the advocacy work of the champions. Um, the champions would have, uh, President Mutlanti indicated in his closing remarks that they are ready to be called on to support. And let me inform you that the, one of the informal ways we describe them is that they are your tool. You use them how you want to, to use them, and you make your, your advocacy and your work uh, 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 move forward with their backing. And they come free. We don't pay anything. They don't get per diems. They don't get anything as long as uh, the program or some of our partners help to 
pay for their air tickets and their accommodation. They do all of this for free, they're engaged, and they are fully committed, as I said. Uh, I was also like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, a little bit uh, unhappy when I saw that among the people or, or institutions that you consider as your partners, champions are not, are not listed. However, we will continue to provide all the support that is uh, necessary and uh, they will be committed for free, as I've said. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind comments, Madam. We will update also the, the list um, of, of partners to reflect uh, the commitment and partners that we that are part of this work. Thank you very much. Uh, is, is there still a burning? I, can I take one last two hands from Zambia? and South Africa in that order, and then we, we close uh, with your permission, Honorables. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman. I think yesterday we discussed very seriously and intensely the need for mobilization of resources within Africa. I didn't quite hear that aspect uh, coming out. Uh, I think there were proposals to the effect that um, Africa should mobilize its own internal resources along the lines of global fund so that uh, we have uh, some kind of security in terms of resources. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, I think as a member of the finance committee of here at PAP, I would love to see resources being generated at the AU level, specifically targeted towards investing in the future of Africa in order to achieve what we have been calling the demographic dividend by investing in the youth to prevent HIV AIDS, to treat those that are infected. Um, that's very important. More, like, more along the lines of uh, resources within the AU budget, which of course are targeted towards peace and security. Uh, in Africa. And here at PAP, we can have a very in-depth in, you know, oversight over those resources which are generated within the continent to go towards uh, prevention, the treatment, you know, of our population that are in danger or vulnerable to HIV AIDS. I didn't quite hear that coming out, but I think it's a, it's a very important um, action point at the continental level over which PAP should have an oversight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. We will factor that in into the outcome document. South Africa, you have the floor, Madam. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Che you know, I have one concern as a member of parliament that uh, from our side as members of the Portfolio Committee Health in South Africa, it is for the first time that we participated in meetings like this. And I think if you can ask me whether there was value for us coming here, yes. We have uh, gained a lot of, 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 of things and experience and best practices which are happening in other countries. And I'm, I'm sure what we we'll love to see happening is that if we can get invitations uh, uh, in such meetings so that, you know, we, we, we can contribute and learn other things. Because, you know, most of the people 
who are here abanye it's like they are not members of parliament they are officials but i think as members of parliament whilst we 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 we, we make laws we can benefit and see how strategically can do other things so um i want to make an appeal that maybe a, 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 it must not be for the first time and for the last time because issues that we were discussing we, we discuss here uh, are very vital for us so uh, i'm not sure how we're going to deal with it but uh, if you can invite us again and but also che you know i don't want to come to meetings and talk 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 and there's no implementation so i think what is important also is that uh, we need to evaluate and check what we have done today if it's implemented so that we must not come again and talk about these things and those things they are there somewhere in libraries or in cupboards but they're not implemented anyway thank you very much thank you very much honorable i think the issue of results driven approach um came out strongly from this meeting and we appreciate that uh, the colleagues from pan-african parliament i think they are here they heard that um, south africa has not been invited or has been invited has not participated as they would have loved in the past and i think uh, colleagues will look into that honorable ladies and gentlemen I think we have come to the end of our meeting and um, we would like to close this meeting officially and uh, I don't have the words to, to uh, close the meeting but I'm going to request the director, um, uh, regional director, UNAIDS to please come to the fore and I'm going to request uh, honorable chair of the PAP Health Committee uh, to also come to the fore and, and give us a few ways of closing. And we are in South Africa, and therefore we're going to ask the honorable member, doctor, uh, to, to please come to the fore and give us a few ways of closing uh, because you are, the, you are the host. And, and the Pan-African Parliament is the host, and South Africa is the host, and just, just yes, yes, Doctor. Um, I'm calling South Africa because I want to go to Addis and be able to come back, uh, and be able to come back without any hindrances at the border. I'm going to request uh, so South Africa to, to start okay. uh, after that I'm going to request uh, UNAIDS to make their closing remarks and the last will be the chair you have the floor sir. Uh, thank you chair this is a thorough ambush but <laughs> But um, duty calls. We, th we thank all those people who made it their, their duty to come here and sacrifice their time and their resources to come and share their knowledge and their resolve to fight uh, this sketch of HIV and to find methodologies and uh, technologies to make a health of our people a priority. A healthy nation is a productive nation and um, HIV, AIDS and TB, as you have heard, are a scythe that is cutting the lives of our people in throughout. So as a host, we hope that uh, we will not uh, relent in trying to do our best to prioritize health of 
all the people in the world and do whatever we can and whatever resource we have to throw into this battle for a better life for everybody. But we have to understand that we have to prioritize the priorities, not just to uh, say, well, we are getting into battle to fight this uh, pandemic without realizing that some of the things that need to be done you know, are more important than just to throw money into a curative uh, methodology of combating this. I think in, in, in health, uh, prevention is better than cure. And we have to actually find the ways of emphasizing prevention rather than emphasizing the curative part of this uh, uh, battle. Then I think we can win it. But if we just go in and say we'll cure people, put them in best medical treatment we can, it's not going to help to stop this pandemic. So I am grateful that you all came here, shared your experiences, shared your uh, enthusiasm, and actually we, sh we wish the whole was whole, the, the whole place was full, because having to go and explain to some other people, it's better if we were a thousand to explain to a million than to explaining to a thousand. So next time, let us make sure that this place is full and we have uh, outflowing, what we call outflow facilities for everybody to hear, everybody to participate, because it is not a battle for the few, it's a battle for everybody. Thank you very much, and we are grateful to have hosted you here. Thank you. Chairperson and honorable members of parliament, um, my partners, the UN colleagues, the bilaterals, civil society, and everybody, including the media who have been here, um, I want to thank you very much for the partnership. And I want to thank you also for taking time out of your busy schedule um, to be part of the audience that listens to the the drums that were be, uh, have been beating. I hope that we have managed to garner the interest to show that time is of the essence. I hope that we have managed to say that speed is of the essence. Not just because um, we have a UN political declaration to report back in 2020, and we're in 2017 at the end of, as I said at the beginning, but also that people are dying. Young girls are being infected every day, 4,000 per week in some places. So there's a lot of urgency. There's lots to be done, lots of people to access services, lots of new infections to stop. And clearly it goes beyond just the meeting and the resolutions because now it's, so what do you do now? and we are hoping that there will be action. We will mobilize our UNAIDS country directors and the un other UN partners and other partners at the country level to work with you because we know you are, have the greatest comparative advantage for moving this agenda forward. You are advocates, naturally. You have the electorate, naturally. So we count on you to mobilize people for testing. We count on you for mobilizing men, women, children, adolescents, speaking to the healthcare services, speaking to the financiers, and take what you have heard today forward. And we have made a commitment as the UN with the PAP, and I hope the chair may speak to that, but we will carry, we're committed to f looking forward having a roadmap that is, reflects the short and medium term resolutions over a period of one to two years. So this is not a short term, and if it goes well, because we've got no choice, even further than the two years. 
And I know in the past we have dropped the ball, we take the blame for that, but we know also that the capacity building has to be continuous, it's not an event. So we make a commitment and we thank you for your time for coming here and we look forward to the journey ahead as will be reflected by the president of the PAP. Thank you so much. Madame. Madam Regional Director of UNAIDS and all your collaborators, uh, Sir of the African Union and the Honorable Representative of South Africa, ladies and gentlemen of civil society, dear colleagues, MPs, ladies and gentlemen, As my big brother was saying earlier, my big brother from South Africa, it is uh, really a thorough ambush because uh, even I was not scheduled to take the floor for the closing session or ceremony of our session. And uh, it is actually His Excellency Roger Encono that had to give us the closing remarks but he is right now in a um, preparatory meeting for the session that will start m on Monday with the ambassadors. And uh, of course, uh, as uh, the chairperson of the uh, Committee on Health, to take the floor and to say a word. And that word is thank you. Thank you to UNAIDS. Thank you to the African Union. Thank you to the civil society. Thank you to all my colleagues, uh, particularly those who are not uh, Pan-African parliamentarians, but uh, accepted this invitation to come and share with us. Thank you very much. And uh, for about 48, hours now, we have mobilized ourselves in order to speak about this high-level meeting in order to uh, attain all our objectives on HIV and AIDS. There's been some great uh, subject matters that were developed by professionals, and we also had uh, uh, politicians in the midst of us in here. I would like to mention the, His Excellency, um, former president of South Africa, a champion that has really encouraged us because if uh, in our respective countries, if we do not have um, uh, great uh, political will, uh, this will not uh, happen. So as parliamentarians, we are the bridge between uh, the people and the government. So we are better placed, uh, and that is the reason why UNAIDS uh, thought that it was the right thing to do to go through us in order to uh, achieve one of uh, its um, objectives because through the MPs, uh, the information can go into the most remote places of uh, the country. And we now have to uh, update um, what we have done so far. And we believe that some of the things that have been done are now obsolete. And uh, we have a mission through the African Union in so that this work um, uh, of updating uh, may be done. And of course, through the roadmap, uh, uh, plan of action should be presented that will not just stay with us at our level, uh, who are here participants at this meeting, but it should be translated into all the languages of the AU and that the UNAID 
uh, may uh, commit to the popularization of these um, uh, documents in all our um, states so that uh, at the next uh, session, the May session, that we will do everything that needs to be done at the level of the committee so that we may have at least half a day uh, consecrated to um, activities on HIV AIDS. And of course, at that moment, uh, it would be uh, a good thing for that uh, document or that paper to be uh, given to the MPs. We would also uh, wish uh, that uh, the UNAIDS may support the actions uh, that will be undertaken by the parliamentarians in their respective countries, because if at the level of the committee, if we have that support and if we are able to go to uh, the um, committees on health in other countries that will have a further impact that will really help uh, the MPs to go into action. So on these words, uh, regional direction of uh, re regional director, sorry, of the UNAIDS. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating at this Africa high level meeting, and we pray that this. Um, partnership will uh, continue and that it will allow us to save human lives. On behalf of uh, the Speaker of the Pan-African Parliament, I would like now to declare closed this Africa high-level parliamentarian meeting on achieving high health target and leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable, for your leadership as a chairperson at a, a, a Pan African Parliament Committee on Health, Labor, and Social Affairs. The last ambush, the last ambush, I, I would like to request uh, all of you, honorable members, to, to come to the fore because we want to document this moment, we want to take the photo, that will be the last ambush. We'd like, we'd like you, all of you to come to the fore uh, and, the, um, and, the, and, the, and the high table to, to be at the front. Uh, our photographer is here. Uh, after that, we will be ready and we will break for lunch. And this, as this meeting has been declared, uh, finished. Thank you very much and travel all very well to those who are traveling. It's a photo moment. Can we please, can we please come to the fore? After taking the photo, if there are any announcement, I would like the, the, the colleagues who have announcements to also be ready. But it's, a, it's the time for the photo now. We are coming here, or maybe we sit here. Oh, maybe we...